Good evening and welcome to the Governing Board of Directors meeting for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.16 p.m. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de the PBUSD. Disponemos de traducción en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Urania Lopez. Um, if anyone would like to speak to any item on the board's agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to that agenda item, and each speaker will have one minute. I also see a lot of new faces here this evening, so I want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes very strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I am now going to lead us to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask Trustee Flores to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Trustee Flores. I will now move us to item 3.2, uh, excuse me, 3.3, superintendent comments. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Heather Contreras, our superintendent, who will make a few comments. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming out to our meeting. We know that it is a very busy time of year with many events. Uh, this last three weeks that I've been in the position, I think I've been to almost all but four or five of the schools. I'm finishing up those site visits in the next week. I've had a wonderful opportunity to meet so many different people and I see familiar faces in the crowd. Um, I'm learning a lot about the districts and all the many strengths which include a community commitment which is wonderful. I also attended the PVFT appreciation which was an exciting event to um, appreciate all the hard work of our teachers and I really do appreciate the hard work. Um, we're at, heading at that time of the year that is everyone is a little bit tired and there's still a lot of celebrating and, and a lot of events to do and really appreciate the hard work of the teachers and I've enjoyed being in classrooms and seeing some of the best teaching I've seen. I also attended the CSEA appreciation dinner. It was wonderful to see all the classified staff come together, uh, enjoying one another, celebrating people who are retiring, celebrating people who have done some excellent work in the job, and just seeing a lot of um, happy faces and people enjoying camaraderie. So that was a, a highlight for me as well. I also want to thank the board because all of the board members have been attending uh, these different site visits with me, and that's a lot of time and dedication to our our schools to do that and I really have appreciated that involvement and that engagement and the communication um, as well so thank you to the board for for doing that and taking that time and committing to uh, the students in the community at Pajaro Valley thank you dr. Contreras I will now move us to item 3.4 governing board comments on standing committees and this is the opportunity for uh, each board member to make a few comments. And we will start with Trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Great to see everybody here and to everybody watching. Just a couple highlights. I got to start by giving a shout out to the PV Band program under Mr. Alanis, winning a big competition over the past weekend. First place in the region. Also, I attended the, the band concert at Mellow Center. It was very impressive. I can see why y'all won. And the talent show a few weeks before was very impressive, over two hours of really cool material and well emceed. Very good presentation. Also want to thank the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County for their uh, Mariposa Arts Program. I attended their student showcase on Saturday at the Watsonville Center for the Arts. I want to thank everybody in that program and the students to see your art pieces was very impressive. And I want to finally give a shout out to uh, Watsonville High. I stopped by, I can't remember the name of the event on Friday, but there were hot dogs. It was a really good vibe. Uh, senior slumber, senior sunset, something like that. Was that right? It was a great vibe. Thank you for the great job that Principal Joe Gregorio has doing, showing leadership on how, what a great high, high school principal does and, and sets a standard for. So thank you.
Thank you, Trustee Bellano Scow. We'll now move to Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, I wasn't here the last board meeting because I had two graduates in my family, daughter Indra from her bachelor's degree and a daughter Hannah from her master's degree in social work. So we're really proud of our family. Um, I did attend the Innovator of the Year Awards and it was a really lovely night to recognize excellence across our campuses. Um, I look forward to going to the adult school graduation tomorrow night. This weekend, uh, I attended a delegation in Sacramento um, for Region 9 for, with other trustees from across California. And what we heard was that the governor's budget going into next year is not good. So um, we'll all um, hear more about that in the next couple of weeks or couple of months, really, um, and start making plans to make sure our district remains solvent. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa, and we did miss you, but congratulations. Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Flores and I went on a site visit with Dr. Contreras to um, Renaissance High School, and it has been great to see the progress that has been happening with the grounds over the last few years, so thank you to our m and team and the advocacy of the site leaders. Um, I also appreciated the conversations with faculty and students. They are really making the most of the opportunities, particularly with the CTE programs. And I appreciated you know, both the, the teachers and the students, their enthusiasm for what, um, what they're building there. I also attended the community-sponsored Ethnic Studies Town Hall. And this was a great discussion about what Ethnic Studies is and what it's not. And the pre presenters and community members discussed what it means to them, as well as addressed some of the issues of contention um, that we've heard about. Our students and teachers need the full support of their administrative team. And we as a board committed to completing the administrative training. And th that has not yet happened. We need to bring this item back to the board to resolve a path forward. And I'm requesting again that it be added as a future agenda item. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Dodge, Jr. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, thank you, Watsall City Council, for letting us be here. I think it's great that we have these meetings here. Uh, I just wanted to be able to say that I attended the scholarship night with, uh, at the Watsall High School, at the Mellow Center with Coach Gregor and his staff. I, you know, I want him and his staff to know I support them 110%, and I continue to look forward to the vision that you guys have out there. Uh, tomorrow, EA Hall is having an expanded learning after school program tomorrow from 3 to 6. So if you're er anywhere in the downtown area, please support uh, EA Hall Middle School, Gold Falcons. And also in July, okay, so thank you very much. And oh, sorry, Danny, don't go. Watson High School is having a car show July 20th. Um, so hopefully you guys can make it out. So I'd just like to say, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Trustee Flores. Hello, sorry about that. I'm being a horrible timekeeper tonight. Um, so I was able to do several site visits with Dr. Contreras, um, very enlightening. It's, uh, I did a lot of site visits when I first became a trustee, but it's different to attend with the superintendent. You get a little a deeper dive into the campuses, which has been really nice. I also wanna say thank you to Council Member Clark and um, Courtney Lindbergh, who's the Director for Public Works for the City of Watsonville. I met with them a few times um, to discuss school safe safe school routes, um, particularly for me, we met at um, Landmark and at Starlight. I also um, was able to comment today for the Board of Supervisors to petition them to make opening Polson Road a uh, a priority for us because it has affected um, a lot of our schools, our, our two charter schools out there, plus you know the traffic that it's created right there at um, Lakeview. And I also wanted to just say congratulations to Mr. Love for his um, Educator of the Year Award given out by the um, Santa Cruz COE. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Trustee Flores. 
Um, we'll now move to me. Um, I want to start with noting that Vice President um, Trustee Oscar Soto does have an excused absence from this evening's meeting. Um, he and myself, as well as Dr. Contreras, as she has already mentioned, had um, the pleasure of attending the um, CSEA um, recognition dinner and appreciation dinner, um, as well as for the res um, there's folks that are retiring from CSEA this year. It was a wonderful event held last Friday night. Um, also had the opportunity to attend the Ag History Dinner out at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds on Saturday evening. Started some great conversations that I'm looking forward to continuing with our folks at the fairgrounds as well as with Dr. Contreras, um, particularly surrounded around fair entries for our students and a continuing um, work with the fairgrounds for our students and youth in the community. And um, just because this is the last meeting to say so before we get into it, I just want to also congratulate all of our graduates. Um, and all of our eighth graders that are promoting um, up to high school. What an accomplishment for all of you. We all wish you the best. We show up and do what we do in the best interest of you. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to remind board members to please sign up for your attendance to those graduations and or promotions. And that will be the end of my comments. We will now move to 3.5 high school student board representatives reports. And we will start with DTI, Diamond Tech Institute. Do we have anyone here from Diamond Tech or is it a virtual presentation? Virtual, thank you. And welcome to PVSD Superintendent Dr. Contreras. I'm Orion Duran. I'm excited to catch you up on everything we've been doing since our last report. Our quarter four character education theme is about being reliable. Reliability is especially important at Diamond because of the collaborative work that we do that really makes us count on each other. There have been lots of exciting activities at Diamond with our Spring Spirit Weeks and our Cinco de Mayo family luncheon event. Ms. Keller made us tacos and our families came to enjoy the folklorico dancing, the pinata, and spent some time together. In April, we had our second biggest, second Big Sur backpacking trip with the Ventana Wilderness. There's 16 students, including myself, who went on a two-day overnight backpacking experience. Everyone was relieved that we didn't run into any bears. This is our first year being able to play with Watsonville High Sports, and we had students participating in the wrestling, track, and baseball. In our own small schools league, we took second place in this year's soccer season. Way to go, White Tigers. We've had quite a few college and career field trips this semester, as well as mentor team building and job shadowing days with our industry partners. It's always fun to get off campus. Team building days was a success with students and mentors completing different challenges and overall enjoying each other's company and making connections. A few program highlights is that our business boards have finally concluded and our students received $2,000 in scholarships provided by the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. Our 10th and 12th grade students placed in the Foundation for Innovation Social Media and Marketing Challenge. In this event, students received over $500 in scholarships. Congratulations. Another organization we work with is Directing Change. Two of the submissions received awards. One got honorable mentions and another became a state finalist. This project has to have a public showing of the film as a requirement. So Ms. Bonner and our counselor decided to create a mental health awareness day called Let's Get Moving for Mental Health, which ended up with a viewing of the Directing Change films. In case you missed it, 10 of the 13 acceptance student films for the Watsonville Film Festival were our very own Diamond Directors. It was a beautiful event to see our students' work being shown and honored. Since it's coming to the end of the year, we have a few shout outs to our Diamond Techies. Two of our juniors were chosen for the top 10 for the Lookout Santa Cruz Unsung Heroes Journalism Project. One of our freshmen won first place for his entry in the AIM Youth Mental Health Art Project, and four more freshmen and sophomores received honorable mentions. This organization helps students worldwide, and the person who gave Brandon this award is the Monterey County Superintendent of Schools. Three students received the Your Futures Are Business CTA scholarships. In total, our students have received over $8,000 in student scholarships this school year. We also have special recognition for the students who received Microsoft and Adobe industry certifications. Students became industry certified in Excel, Word, Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere Pro. These are impressive certifications for our students to have and for their futures. Of course, I want to give a big thumbs up to my classmates, Eileen and Alexa, for being salutatorian and valedictorian, and the three students, uh, the seniors, who received the seal of biliteracy. We also had our stoles awarded for the seniors, 
and people who showed excellency in our five pathways. Congratulations to the seniors, well deserved. Well, we can't well we're we can't wait to wear this in just a few weeks. Speaking of graduation, you're all cordially invited to the Diamond Tech graduation ceremony, which will be held Thursday, June 6th at 3 p.m. in the Mellow Center. As always, don't forget to follow us on social media and thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. Have a great rest of your day and the rest of the school year and summer. Thank you, Diamond Tech. I'm gonna now move us to um, item 4.1, the approval of the agenda. I'm gonna make a motion to approve the agenda with removing item 12.3 per staff request and moving item 12.1 to before item 9.1. Can I have a second? I'll make a second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That motion will carry 601. Uh, moving to item 5.1, the approval of the April 24th, 2024 special board meetings. Meeting minutes, can I have a motion to approve? I'd like to motion, make a motion to approve the minutes for April 24th. I have a first, can I have a second? Second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry as well, 601. Um, moving to item. Sorry, give us one quick second. All right, so we're moving to item, we've had a little change in our agenda this evening. Um, we're now moving to item 6.1, the action on report on closed session. Um, in closed session under item 2.1, the board voted 403 to approve the recommendation from district administration, administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the semester and next for student number 23-24-028 and a full expulsion for one year for student number 23-24-030. Um, motion number one, uh, for closed session item 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on May 22nd, 2024, with seven and eight additional action items. That is a first, I need a second. I'll second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That motion will carry 601. Um, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on May 22nd, 2024, with five and eight additional action items. That was a motion. Can I have a second? I'll second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Closed session item 2.7, the special education settlement for a student under closed session, ses, under closed session agenda item 2.7, the board voted uh, four, zero, one, two, uh, to approve a settlement agreement for one special education student. Under closed session um, agenda item 2.8 regarding resolution number 23-24-48, the board approved the non, no, sorry, that item was removed. Sorry. Um, Forget um, item number 2.8, sorry, Eva. Um, so we have a few announcements. Announcement number one, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Nicole Marsh as the new principal of Pacific Coast Charter. 
Nicole, Nicole began serving students in 1998 as a fourth grade teacher and has since been an elementary school teacher serving intermediate grade levels. A seventh grade ELA slash SS core teacher, a reading intervention teacher and academic coordinator for Bradley Elementary and Rio Del Mar, the coordinator of early childhood literacy for PBUSD, and most recently as the principal of Main Street Elementary. She received a Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies from Bethany College, as well as a Master's in Education from the same institution. She earned her multiple subject teaching credential from Bethany as well. She also holds an administrative credential from Cal State University East Bay. We are excited to welcome Nicole back to PBSD and look forward to having her in her new role. Go Pelicans. Welcome, Nicole. Our second announcement out of closed session, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Kent Johnson as a new assistant principal of Pajaro Valley High School. Kent began his career as a fine arts teacher specializing in music and choral instruction. In an administrative role, he has served as the director of instrumental music for the San Ramon Valley Unified School District. He has also held the position of assistant principal for the Sedona Red Rock High School while simultaneously serving as the principal for sixth through eighth grades at the same school. Most recently, he has been serving as the assistant principal at Prospect High School. Kent holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Metropolitan State University in Music Education, a Master's of Science in Education from Cal State Hayward. He holds a California single subject credential as well as a California administrative credential. We are excited to welcome this experienced educator into our district, Go Grizzlies. And those are the, the reports we have out. Okay, and that completes our report out of closed session. Um, now we will move to item seven, our consent agenda. Consent items are routine items coming before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? Trustee Dodge. Ed? Seven point what? Seven. Seven? No. Nope. No. We have none. So um, we are going to, um, I'm going to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with moving item 711, the approval notice of award for the Watsonville High School Sports Field Improvements Projects, number 2024025. -025. Are there any other items that any board member wishes to have deferred? Seeing none, I've just made a motion. Can I have a second? Second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. And now we will move to our deferred consent agenda items. Um, 7.11, approval of the notice of award for the Watsonville High School Sports Fields Improvement Project, number 2024025. Do we have any representatives here that could speak to this item? I see we have our Director of Maintenance, Ops, and Facilities. Could we also have our principal from Watsonville High come up to the podium and join them? Do we have any representatives as well for the donation, Mr. Gregorio? Uh, no, they couldn't make it. Okay. Yeah. We'll take the three of you. Thank you for being with us tonight. So I'm here to ask for the approval of the sports field at what's behind the Blackburn Street. We did advertise, and as you can see here on the uh, bid results, the only contractor that was present that day was K&D Landscape with a price of 178434 so I'm asking the board if they could move forward with this project so we could get this field done at Watsonville High. Thank you. 
Mr. Gregorio, would you like to add some comments on this item about how we got to here today? Uh, yeah, the uh, Driscoll's uh, was very generous and donated uh, 150, and then I think he added some more. I don't know the exact amount. And uh, the idea was that to create more field space for kids to be able to play soccer, of uh, uh, different sports on that field, uh, because it was had just different things was wrong with it. So um, they were very generous with it. And as we move forward, we uh, raised some more funds to uh, to get to the number for the bid and um, made us operations and Sergio and Linda did an amazing job of getting the bid and, and getting the job done for us. Thank you, Mr. Gorio. When are we looking to be done with this project? Do you have an idea? Contractor's ready to go, so as soon as we get approval tonight, we could uh, get the ball going with him. He's uh, anxious to get this project started. And it's, it is gotta be hydro seed, so, you know, it takes about a couple months to get the seed germinated and grass ready to, to play on, so. That's what we're looking at. Are you thinking that it'll be ready at the beginning of the school year in August? It'll be close for that. Maybe August, September, maybe September, early September will be ready. Just because we want to let the grass really establish before we start playing on it because, it, you know, we got to let it do its thing. Wonderful. Any other questions, comment? Trustee Dodge Jr., I know you. Uh, I, I'd just like to thank you, Coach Gugoro and your staff. Uh, MNO, you know, I know I bother you guys with a bunch of emails, but you know, I just, uh, I'm here listening to my constituents, my community, and I thank you guys for your vision and working with, doing what you do. So don't take it personal, like, oh, why is Dodge always emailing me? You know, but just, you know, because <laughs> I know that's what you think, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, here listening to what my constituents are saying, so thank you very much. Don't worry, Dr. Contreras and I were on the receiving end of the same email, so. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here tonight and to being able to speak to it. And I think we also owe a huge shout out to Driscoll's for their $100,000 plus dollar contribution, which if it weren't for that, this would not be happening. Am I correct? Yes, correct. All right. Can we just give a big round of applause to Driscoll's? Luis, Luis Guerrero helped us set that up. I'm sorry, Mr. Gregorio. Luis Guerrero was uh, the, the representative from Driscoll's that helped set that all up. Well, please tell him a big thank you from us. I, I think Luis Guerrero is here, and I believe oh, Jenna from yeah. Driscoll's. Oh, so if they could come up, then we could say thank you. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot, but that's what happens. Hi, good evening. I am Jenna Rivera, and I'm here with my colleague, Luis Guerrero, who is a coach, not only at Watsonville High School, but in other community um, programs here in Watsonville. For us at the district level, this was a project that not only served Watsonville High School students, but other organizations that use the open fields and the facilities at Watsonville High School. So it's a win for not only our students, but the community in general, um, which was for us, a project that we couldn't say no to. So we're happy to stand here and support this. Um, and we thank you for, for all your work in, in helping us move this forward. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to make a motion that we support agenda item 7.11. I'm gonna second that. And thank you again, Driscoll's, for all your help and support. You've done it in so many ways for Pajaro Valley Unified School District. and. We are super appreciative of it. As I noted, this would not be happening without that support, so thank you very much. So I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you, Driscoll's. Thank you. We will be moving to item 12.1, the adoption of resolution to authorize a general obligation bond election of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. This report will be presented by our Director of Fiscal Service, Jenny M., and as well as Dell Scott, President at Dell Scott & Company, 
as well as the board's um, general legal counsel. All of those, please come forward and welcome. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras. My name is Jenny M. I am the Director of Fiscal Services. And I am here with a dedicated team who have put together um, a presentation showing um, the election strategy for the bond measure for the November ballot, as well as an update on our facility master plan. We have with us Dale Scott, President at Dale Scott and Company, who will be doing the first presentation on the election strategy. And with us, we have 196 Architects. We have Laf Ralph LaRue, who is the principal, and Vijay Jaya Chandran, Director of Stacked, who will be doing the second presentation on facility needs and the progress of the master plan. So Dale, I will um, have you do the first presentation. <coughs> Good evening. I am going to give a very short presentation. <clears throat> um, it's kind of where we've been before, I'll give you a few reminders of what we've been discussing. Um, with me, by the way, is Dan Maruccio of Lozano, who's counsel to the district. If any legal questions come up or any <clears throat> really difficult questions, I'll say, Dan, <laughs> why don't you come up and talk about this? But I'm going to start by reminding you about the survey we did of voters uh, a number of months ago. We asked them the question of, whether they would be supporting a bond on the amount of about $315 million. <clears throat> Before giving them any information, uh, we had a combination of voters that said they were, we, would be voting yes or would be leaning to vote yes of 66% after information. That went to 69%. On the next page, we also asked voters how they felt if they knew certain projects would be funded, if they would be more likely or less likely to vote for the project. I've just taken a few of the top projects here. You can see uh, renovate classrooms and expand career and tech programs. Over 70% of the voters said that they would uh, be more likely to vote for it, repair and replace leaky roofs over 70%, develop technical robotics coding and construction courses over 70%, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at this upcoming election, the 2024 election, there, were, there are actually three proposals that are before you, three different resolutions, and you're going to have to choose one to move forward with. Let me give you background on those three resolutions. <clears throat> I started by looking at the estimated tax rates of the bonds that have already been passed by the voters in this district. There was a bond in 2012 and a bond in 2002. They are still being repaid. This is our estimate of the tax rate per $100,000 of assessed valuation that voters are currently, that, I'm sorry, not voters, that taxpayers are currently paying. So you can see the combined amount is roughly $60 per $100,000 of assessed valuation for the next six years, and then it falls off down to about $30. We looked at three different, well, we looked at two different alternatives, and then I've added one that I want you to also consider. The first one was the $315 million alternative, and I've showed this in this case as what the tax rate would be when it stacks on top of the tax rate that's already been paid, and that's really the way taxpayers look at it. They don't think about how much am I paying for this one or how much am I paying for that one. They think about what am I paying in total. So if we look at the $315 million proposal, you can see that that total tax rate would go up to roughly $120 for four years. That's because of the outstanding bonds. It would then fall down to roughly uh, $70, $80, and then it would stay at that amount for a number of years. That's the $315 million proposal. <clears throat> there was a request made at a recent board meeting that we look at a smaller amount. $195 million. <clears throat> you can see the impact of this is the tax rate, total tax rate, would fall to roughly $100 for that four years and then fall again to about the 70, 75 for a lesser number of years and then fall off. I then begin to play with this with our staff and wanted to also offer you a third alternative 
which would be somewhere in the middle for $295 million. In this case, we could actually shift the tax rate over so there wouldn't be that large spike in the beginning up to $120. It would be at roughly $95 for a number of years and hold at that amount um, over the course. We sort of fitted that new tax into the old tax rates so it's more consistent and not jumping up and down. Those three amounts are represented in your three um, resolutions that are before you. And then when a motion is made, you will have to say, I want to move for either option one, option two, or option three. I wanted to point out um, just the, the potential for this upcoming election, for the presidential election. Uh, we looked at all of the bond elections that have been on the ballot in the state of California for uh, for K-12 districts for the past 20 years, you can see that those measures that were on the presidential ballot, 90% of those measures passed. It begins to fall off as we go to the gubernatorial ballot. It begins to fall off again as we go to the primary ballot down to 71%. And then another issue I wanted to get on your radar is what happens if you decide not to proceed and to delay. As we've discussed, you can only put a general obligation bond on the ballot during a general election. So we think of, OK, well, that's not so far. 2026 doesn't sound so far away. But in fact, it would not be until the end of 26. You can see from this table, in the November gubernatorial 26 election, the district would not receive funding until 2027. If you waited to the next presidential election, you would not receive funding until 2029. So again, to go over your three alternatives, $315 million, $195 million, $295 million. If you drop down to the bottom line, you can see the incremental tax rate increase of $60, $40, and $32. $32 being the option three. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, although I think there's a desire to go on to the next presentation, and we'll come back for questions at that time. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Ralph Larue with 196 Architects. i um, excited to be here. I have a longer presentation. We have a lot to get through. So if I go too quickly, um, feel free to um, revisit it um, afterwards. Uh, this has been a long road for me. I'm, I'm super honored to be here. Uh, we were hired, I think, more than four years ago to start uh, on this master planning journey. And um, in the midst of that, we had COVID and, and um, we had a pause, but during that time, we really took time to study each campus. There were no kids there at the time. And uh, we spent that time wisely in developing your plan at a dogmatic pace. What was really missing at the time is the community and um, outreach portion, which really this is kind of the, the part of that. So excited to be here. Um, so 196 Architects focuses on school districts. I work with every school district in the county, and the reason why I say that is um, through the bond cycle, I learned, th learned things um, through those efforts. Um, for instance, there's, just to give you some examples, there's well, we're involved with some wellness centers with the County Office of Ed, and we're instituting some of those um, at some of the high schools, at Santa Cruz City Schools. Uh, we look forward to doing joint use projects. You have one potentially at Rolling Hills. Um, uh, there's there's T TK expansion coming along across the board, things like that we have to pay atten attention to. But with Pajaro, we, we really involved in, on every um, on every layer, up, updating your, your campuses, um, also in, uh, installed all the district-wide shade structures during the um, COVID-19. And so I'm going to walk you through a, a bunch of project types, but um, I'm going to have uh, Jenny. So just to summarize um, some of the information that Dale Scott just presented. So we have three bond options um, on the table. So option A is for 315 million, option B 195 million, option C. 
uh, 295 million. As we walk you through the presentation today, you will start to see um, some pretty staggering numbers on our facility needs based on the facility master plan. So as we start looking at what the need is, um, I want you to keep that number in mind as, as you make the discussion and um, on which bond option to go with. Um, so the uh, need today that is established is based on the preliminary work that 196 Architects has done, um, as Ra Ralph said, over the last four years. So this is a, a, a draft right now, and we will be continuing to um, collect community input throughout the summer. Um, hopefully when the bond um, passes in November, um, we will have more input at that point to finalize a final facility master plan. Um, so I wanted to point out that we currently are still closing out our last Measure L bond. We have a really excellent community-focused bond program. Um, we run a fiscally responsible debt policy. We have a established Great Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And we have had excellent, clean, annual independent audits. I just wanted to point that out. So when we look at the facilities, um, we can see, I wanted to point out that nearly 40% of our sites were first occupied prior to 1960. And uh, Trustee Dodge, I wanted to say that you have the honor of having the four oldest sites in your area. So um, Minty White and Radcliffe were first established. So we have buildings that were first established in the 1920s. And we have EA Hall and Watsonville High School that were first occupied and established in 1930. So with the honor of having these historic buildings and, and kind of the meaning it has to the community, there are also um, additional needs to keep up with those facilities, modernize them. 40% um, uh, first occupied prior to 1960. So if we think about all the modernization, the changes also to instructional programs that we'll be going over. Um, you know, changes to climate and what that means for um, student and staff comfort in those classrooms. So I want you to um, keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. The district also owns around 400 portable classrooms and office buildings. Um, portables usually have a lifespan of around 20 to 30 years. And you'll see that uh, further in the presentation, we have portables that exceed twice the lifespan. And um, we are hoping with this new bond measure to start moving away from having portables and start moving towards having permanent uh, classroom spaces for our sites and for our students. So we, we approach the master planning um, on, in a tiered process. Um, phase one is, uh, you know, we do our homework, um, our background and our facility analysis. And then uh, once we have that all in place, we, we start developing um, what if plans uh, for presentation. So really we're right now at the, uh, on the runway with uh, part four where we've done a comprehensive master plan. So it wasn't targeted, it was comprehensive. What if you upgraded every site, um, you know, every aspect of every site? So you're going to see the numbers at the end of this uh, slide are astronomical. It's because it, it's a comprehensive um, master plan. So particularly in phase four will be prioritization. And, and that's, where, that's the key of, of the outreach process. <clears throat> Um, so in our master plan, you'll reference uh, different concepts. Safety and security, obviously, is always number one. Uh, flexible learning inside the classroom, environment and sustainability, community and collaboration we focus on. Um, when you see the pie graph of where all the money sits, uh, repurpose and replacement is, is also is very important. Um, there are big ticket items uh, weaved in the project, like uh, we definitely want to consider adding cooling. In the future, we recommend it, but that's for further discussion. Um, so in our process, we will uh, first order the business is we do a facility assessment plan. 
of each campus and we documented, um, we met with every principal um, in the school district and we said, um, you know, what wasn't achieved from the previous bond, we made a list and what would you like in the future? And we also um, asked for some anecdotal evidence of things that only site administration would see, you know, like elementary, do your cars stack onto the road, how far, you know, house pick up and drop off. It's not something you can pick up from a plan. And then um, once we have all that information, we start developing potential projects. Um, I picked this site to show because obviously there's two potential marquee projects there that I know is very important to the community that we have to consider um, and, and discuss. Um, at Pajaro Valley High School, there was actually a performing arts center designed in February uh, and approved by Division of State Architect, DSA, um, February 2018, so not so long ago. Um, performing arts centers are exper uh, expensive. We're working on uh, one right now. It's roughly $1,200 uh, a square foot is our minimal one. So when you do design these facilities in today, because we've had four years of major uh, construction escalation, we have to be sensible to sensitive to budget as well. <coughs> um, so in the outdoor environment, we want to give a cheers. This is one of my proudest projects, actually, where we followed the uh, California Department of Education standards, really. And this is a role model site. Um, at Hall District where we configured, uh, we separated the buses from the, the vehicles and made a safe uh, pedestrian access. So really awesome project. Uh, another awesome project that we were involved with um, was transforming uh, EA Hall Field. And particularly when the, the budget doesn't quite, quite meet, meet the wish list, um, we um, aligned the field so that a future tech track could be added. At, at a time, but it's really uh, useful, <clears throat> and both the um, school district and the city uses it, so it's a great joint use project. <clears throat> um, it's becoming a standard uh, throughout uh, California, really, is um, when we upgrade great playgrounds, um, we want to make them ADA, but just not basic ADA. We want somebody in a wheelchair to be actually get up and be involved with the, the play. And so you can see um, an example on the right, a newly completed uh, playground, roughly three years old now, um, where we have a, a ramp that's part of the play structure. <clears throat> so we recommend that and a poured in place, which is a safety surface. The, the depth of that poured in place um, is determined by the height of the play equipment so that if somebody falls, they don't hurt themselves. <clears throat> um, Flat work, flat work, flat work. So uh, it's an ongoing maintenance uh, issue, but it's also opportunity to cre create great outdoor spaces for children, uh, not just indoor spaces. Um, so that's an example of um, a space that we recently transformed. Um, for me, um, portables um, is, are like a time bomb, really. They're, um, they're really only meant to be 20 years old, and in our environment, um, it's, it's kind of harsh on portables because we're a little bit moist in this area. Um, so we see that it's ongoing uh, maintenance issue and we really recommend um, actually, you know, replacing with um, site built construction, which is going to last you, you know, three, four times more and over time it's actually cheaper. <clears throat> Um, some more success stories, um, and this is kind of, you know, as we look at other spaces in the district, we want to transform um, older spaces uh, with vibrant, new, flexible furniture, you know, stimulate kids and, and learning. <clears throat> um, indoor environment, um, there's some good things. Uh, I think your tech is in good shape. Um, a lot of the just basic smaller things like the cabinetry, is, it, it's peeling, there's some um, exterior facade um, that needs to be uh, repaired to protect, really protect your classrooms and your, your investment. Um, some other examples of some success stories at Starlight uh, using flexible furniture. 
<clears throat> and then CTE spaces, uh, truly love these, these spaces. They're very visceral and you get to do things. Um, so we try to em emphasize um, a lot of natural light, high ceilings, flexible, uh, flexible furniture and workbenches. Um, so there you can see some examples. Um, those programs are amazing for, for children. <clears throat> Um, I, I took one site just just out of interest and um, and averaged out the the years old of the portables uh, that are the pretty poor shape in minty white. The average age of this spreadsheet is 32 years old. So they're they're definitely, if you can imagine, um, another four years they're going to be you know old. You're going to have to. Um, renovate them or re-roof them and for me that's just sunk cost because it's going to keep on aging. <clears throat> um, so when you do replace portables, um, I, you know, you may consider um, doing two stories. If you do enough classrooms, it's actually, it becomes a wash with the cost of doing a one story. So it's normally 10 or 12 classrooms, you can imagine six on six it starts to become more economical and you free up some site space. We, uh, we worked on uh, Soquel Union School District Bond a few years ago with 42 million. We replaced all the portables in the district. We hope to bring some of that success to Pajaro as well. <clears throat> um, workforce housing, there's an interest throughout California in workforce housing. Almost every school district asks, asks us to um, do a study on the surplus property. Uh, we're actively involved right now. We have, uh, I think, Solidad, which is the closest to breaking ground in the next few months. Um, and then I manage the uh, Santa Cruz City School project on Swift Street. Um, back in 2016, we did a, a study um, for MST. You have a triangular uh, portion of land that could, could be considered a surplus. Um, and so, you know, if there's a willingness to consider that within this bond, we would do that as well in terms of a layout. Um, and then I thought I'd just give you some sample um, costs. This is hot off the press in terms of Santa Cruz City Schools. They were originally considering doing 80 units. Um, the project cost for construction, so not just construction cost, the project cost, which includes the soft cost, was uh, 750K per unit. So they financed it. With 60 million, they're going to do a combination of 34 million bond and um, 24 million um, COP certificates of participation, which is a loan. <clears throat> um, and they hope to offer their staff 65% uh, of market rate. Of course, it took them five years to get there. We did uh, staff surveys um, and to make sure there's interest, and then we extrapolated the unit mix of those. And we, we've also visited a number of uh, projects that are built in the Bay Area for comparison. <clears throat> uh, so with all that said, we're going to show you some big numbers and walk you through how we, how we got there. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vijay Jayachandran. I'm from STACT. Uh, I took the comprehensive master plan developed by 1906 and did the estimates on him. Uh, just bear in mind that these estimates uh, do, these numbers do appear large because at this stage, uh, you know, the project hasn't been defined. And once the projects, you know, go through the motion, uh, the architectural drawings and everything, and we get it out of bed, these numbers will fall. But uh, there's enough contingencies built into these numbers. So the, the graph on, the, sorry, the table on the right actually shows the costs for the, uh, for the need, the, sorry, we took the needs assessment that uh, Ralph had developed and developed the cost for it. So this, uh, the table on the right actually shows you all the costs for each of the schools. And then on the pie chart on the top left corner, which says cost distributed by the school, shows you how this um, has been sort of distributed between elementary, middle, high, and charter schools. Uh, the pie chart on the bottom, it shows you how it's been broken up by project types. And the largest pie in that is the 73% that's been allocated for modernization and replacement of portables. Can we go to the next slide? 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so it's just a broad overview of the project types. Um, the categories are parking, access, campus safety, outdoor learning, uh, play areas and sustainability, uh, modernization and new construction. And then the description, the next, uh, the next column alongside it, uh, actually describes the type of projects, the detailed projects in these broad categories, and then the costs. Um, as the next step, once the, um, once the board approves the bond, the next step would be prioritizing these projects. And prioritizing the projects is usually done by, uh, very systematically using some measures, like if it's a heavy, if it's a hot code item, those get addressed. And then uh, you go through safety, utilities, and uh, the building envelope, basically indoor air quality. So the sites that you just saw, um, I think it showed where we currently are with our facilities and a vision of where we want to get to. Um, I think the projects that our amazing MNO team have accomplished so far, sorry, show um, how much we can enrich the classrooms for our students and for our staff. Um, we talk about students, how to get them to come to school more, increase their attendance, make them excited to, to learn. So providing comfortable, safe, enriching environments, that's so important for, for um, our students. We've heard also from our community members and students coming about the need at Paro Valley High School. So with this bond, we would be able to prioritize a marquee project um, to, to give them equitable access to what the other two high schools have. And that would be a priority, um, I believe, for administration, the board, and the community. So just to kind of bring back, we spoke about the one $1.2 billion need. Um, as VJ mentioned, that does have um, a contingency built in, which is standard for modernization projects. So um, Hurley and Serge could talk more about this um, during uh, board uh, comments. Um, but again, I wanted to kind of point out the need against the three bond measures. Um, so as we're looking and considering which bond to go with um, and thinking about some of the interest around um, a potential performing arts center, um, workforce housing, and looking at really the infrastructure coding, safety, instructional, um, energy saving needs across the district, that would be something to, to balance against each other. So what this slide shows is where we are in the process. So um, we developed a draft master facility plan. Um, today we bring this to board um, for discussion and hopefully approval. Um, next, we would be continuing stakeholder engagement um, and gathering more community input. Um, finalizing um, the, the final facility master plan. Um, voters would bring this, um, would vote on this in November. And then after the vote, um, hopefully it passes, and then district leadership in collaboration with the board and the community would then finalize their pr uh, project priorities to be implemented over the next 10 years. And uh, before wrapping up this project, I just wanted to say a big thank you to um, our guests, Mr. Dale Scott, Mr. Ralph LaRue, and uh, Mr. Uh, Vijay, uh, I'm sorry, Van uh, uh, Chandran. And then um, if I may, I just wanted to give a big shout of gratitude to our amazing MNO team, uh, Hurley and Serge, who are here today. If we could just maybe give them a round of applause. They had a huge lift with not only um, finishing up the Measure L projects, but all of the ESSER projects, dealing with um, the flood, opening up PMS, and all of the facility grants that we got for Migrant Seasonal Head Start and Food and Nutrition. Um, I mean, they're basically running probably the largest construction company in the county while um, keeping up with all of the other MNO needs for our staff and students. So thank you so much. And I will open up to questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? I believe Casey Van Wevel. I'm not sure if he spoke, but. 
Next up, we have Francisco Rodriguez. I submitted a card to speak. Yeah, but there were, there was other cards presented. What before this you. item? Yes. Let's so just, I'm gonna I'm gonna call the three speakers in order of receiving the cards. We have Casey. For Van this, Den this item. Yes. We have Casey Van Den Hevel. Francisco Rodriguez, and then Marilyn Garrett. If you all three could please come up. Uh, thank you. My name is Francisco Rodriguez. I'm a resident here of uh, Watsonville. Um, I was a strong supporter of the, your last bond. Um, and as you know, um, there were many projects that were done uh, in fact, um, a, a school half a block from my house, uh, McQuitty School, uh, has a you know really nice playground there. Um, and so, uh, as a taxpayer, um, I do want to point out a couple, well, actually three things to you. Uh, number one, uh, we need access. McQuitty School is locked up. I have a nine-year-old and an eleven-year-old that live half a block away from a brand new play structure that I cannot walk half a, way, half a block and be there with them. There is no access to that playground after school. There's no access to the playground on weekends. My second point is cleanup. As you know, uh, as was mentioned here uh, earlier in the presentation, Watsonville High School, Minty White, are one of the oldest schools uh, sites. Um, however, I don't know if any of you have gone uh, or seen behind the music room in Watsonville High School. It's a mess. And that doesn't cost, it's not going to cost $195 million to clean up. Mr. Second, Rodriguez, I'll, I'll let you know that's time. Thank you. The, Sorry. Thank you. And the third item I had was just that you need to have a project labor agreement for any building that needs to be constructed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Ms. Garrett. Ms. Garrett, you are next. Many thoughts came up as I was watching this. And the new superintendent here, have me having attended all kinds of public city council, board of supervisors, school district meetings, the procedure is people just walk up to speak. They don't fill out a card. So for instance, there were a lot of presentations here of different aspects that I think people in the public here might want to comment on. And I think it needs to, the policy needs to be changed to what every other jurisdiction is doing to increase public participation. So a few of my comments are artificial turf is toxic. It heats up. Children get MRSA infections from falling on it. Um, it, it. It's not a good thing, the toxic turf. That's one thing. And Wi-Fi, all of these schools, the first thing is it should be a healthy environment with pulse microwave radiation from antennas, 5G, Wi-Fi. It is not safe. Th it is not secure. Th that was and one, uh, I know one, I'm out thank of you. time here, but I'll give you a copy of this time to remove Wi-Fi from the school. It's like everybody's smoking everywhere all the time, 24-7, and people walking in and being oblivious. It's toxic Wi-Fi microwave thank radiation. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is that all of our public speakers to this item? Yes. All right, I will bring it back to the board for deliberation, discussion, and comments. 
trustee, someone, anyone. Okay, <laughs> Trustee Flores. I want to thank you all for um, coming out tonight, uh, Dale Scott, architects, and Mano, Jenny. Thank you so much for all the work that you guys have done um, in preparation for us to make this really important decision tonight. Um, one thing that I really did like hearing was uh, that we will make um, a, a performing arts building a priority at um, Paro, High, Paro Valley High School because that is something that is very much needed out there. Um, so that was really nice to see. Um, I love the, the renderings. That's really excited, uh, exciting. I I'm, I'm, didn't realize we already had approached this um, subject, so that's really nice to see that we're already you know, a step ahead. So thank you for that, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Anyone else from the board? Trustee Dodge, Jr. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how my colleagues feel, but I would like to support option A. Um, as I've always been saying, and the only reason why I'm here, because before me, a, a lot of my constituents came to, from Miniway, E Hall, Radcliffe, and Watsonville High. Uh, I'm only here because the Measure L told us that we were going to have a track or portables at the schools that I represent. And I've only been here a couple of years, but I know about the auditorium at Ea Hall, how it's always cold. I know about the air conditioning in Watsonville High because I attended Watsonville High. And I read the emails. You know, I, I hear what the administration is saying. You know, the students, the, you know, the, the teachers, the, the people that live in my, you know, in my area. But we also talk about teacher housing. You know, all across California, we keep talking about teacher housing, teacher housing. What are we going to do to make sure that we keep our teachers here? You just saw the report. You know, this, this was a great report, you know, from, from the consultants, from Ginny M. Um, the community is watching this. You know, the, the media is here is watching this, you know, Hopefully we could, you know, we could support the, the measure for option A. So whether, you know, this is going to be a big presidential year. You know, whoever people decide to vote for and, you know, for president, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, independent, think about Watsonville. You know, think about our neighbors, our children, our, 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 our teachers, our community, and our, and our schools. You know, these schools, you know, my, my grandparents graduated from Watsonville High in 1948. And I graduated in 2000, and you know, some of us here, you know, we, we attended Watsonville High, and you know, we want air conditioning infrastructure for our children, you know, and, and when you look at this, this is for generations, and so when we talk about children in our schools, I think this is a great opportunity to support. Uh, and so I would like to make a motion that we support option A, you know, we'll, Many of us will not be here, but at least this money will be here for our children and our schools. So I hope my colleagues could support option A. And, um, you know, Watsonville has a great saying that we should listen to is, you know, let the people vote. You know, it, it's the people, it's the voters, it's the community, and, you know, let them decide. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. D Trustee Dr. Holm, I saw boom, boom, sorry. I think that was beautifully expressed, Trustee Dodge Jr. Um, I also support um, the A version. I I think about all of the emails that we got over the, the previous years about you know the the classroom conditions when the weather gets warm. That kind of environment's not going to change anytime soon, and we have to do something about that. And we we have to also address not just the basic needs, but some of the important life-fulfilling needs like you know, performing arts centers, like you know, pools and things like that. We need to be able to look at that whole picture. And given the scope of our need, I just don't feel, I don't see how we can ask for less. We're already asking for less than we need, right? But let's at least aim for the highest that we think it can be supported. Um, and, you know, just looking at the, the monthly costs, it, it's just not, 
significantly different. I know it's, it's um, anytime we ask for an increase, that's a challenge. But the need is great. So I'm also in support. Trustee Dr. Holm, is that a second? Yes, I will second it. All right, I have a first and second. I'm going to bring it back to the board for further deliberation and discussion. Trustee Bellano Scout. Uh, yeah, thank you um, to my fellow trustees for their comments, and thank you. This is a great presentation, very, very thorough. I'm, I'm very impressed with the depth of it, and, and thank you, Dr. Contreras, for, for ensuring that quality presentation. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm also wanting to lean to go in big here for all the reasons. Um, it's, it's important that we build a new infrastructure, and it's less, uh, it's less sexy sometimes, but we also need to rebuild what we already have. Uh, we have a lot of crumbling infrastructure in this district, in this country, and we need to also rebuild. Um, if, if I might ask uh, Mr. Scott, if you were to, to be pressed to make a strategic argument for option C instead of option A, what would you say? Uh, just to uh, refresh everybody's memory, <laughs> option A is the, or option the, one is the 300 and 15 versus 15 the 295, that's three. a 20 million dollar difference. Um, the, <clears throat> the obvious argument for option three is that the tax rate is less uh, significantly in the first few years, um, but that the dollar amount really does is not a great deal less. Um, so it's really balancing off those two. And could you just could you just clarify that just for our public education and, and everybody's what what that those differences are, if you wouldn't mind? I, um, certainly, I the difference is between I'll just do option one and option three. The difference in amount that is provided is a difference of three hundred and fifteen to two hundred ninety five, or a difference of twenty million dollars. The difference in the marginal tax rate, the tax rate that voters would be uh, taxpayers would be paying in the first four to five years. Uh, it goes from $60 per 100000 for the first option to $32 per $100,000 for the third option. Now, that goes a lot longer. That $32 continues over time, and that's how you get the two amounts to be about the same. So it's leveling it out as opposed to having a spike and then go down at the end. <clears throat> In the scheme of things, the two measures are not terribly different. It's just how do you allocate those taxes. And the dollar amount is roughly the same, honestly. And if we went for option A, does it give us an advantage to, is there any difference in the financing of projects in the first couple of years? Do we have an advantage or either way we're? No. We're, okay. No, the, the, the disadvantage is at the end. When, at the end. When, you, when, you, when you're out of money, that's exactly. the disadvantage. And there's a $20 million difference, and that's $20 correct. million dollars is a pretty good chunk of change and could go a long ways yeah, at our, that is our facility. Yeah. So, so that's persuading me to lean towards option A as well. Uh, Thank you. On that note, if I can add one comment, which I failed to make, and I just want to reemphasize, I think I've said it before, to remind the board that under Proposition 39, this requires a two-thirds vote of the seats of the board, so it will require an actually five yes votes in order to pass. And I'd, and I'd just like to thank everybody who came out in support and all the comments we've gotten over the year, uh, BV High and throughout the entire district. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bellano Scown. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. I have a couple of extra questions. So I really, Dale, I really appreciate that you prepared an option C for us. Um, I think my concerns, you heard my concerns last time about what this is gonna mean for people, for seniors who are on fixed incomes. We're the fastest growing county in the whole state for people over the age of 65. Many of those people are widowed, alone, have a home by themselves that will be um, having an extra taxes on their property tax bill. There's um, no way to get out of that. It's not a parcel tax where our seniors can opt out. They're gonna to have to pay these taxes. We have rising, a lot of rising costs between PG&E and our water, SoCal Water Creek went up like more than double, I think, for our senior citizen, for actually for all the taxpayers in that area. So there's a lot of pressure um, on people right now. So I really appreciate um, the, the option three because I think it'll be less of a hit on people's tax, property taxes, is that true? 
um, in those first, um, I believe it's four years, yes, in the first four years. Just for the first four years, but after right. that it goes up then? After that, they're roughly the same. So it'll go up to around 60 after that? So it's $32, $32 per asset, um, per assessed value? <clears throat> the difference between the two is in the first, uh, for option one, in the first four years, the total tax rate, <clears throat> the combined of all the numbers, is $120, $60 marginal increase. Under the so I need you to s just break it down so that the public can understand this. So what does that get, if you have a, let's just say your home is worth a million dollars because in this county, that's not, that's yeah. normal <clears throat> because our property values are so high. So for somebody who has a million dollar home, what is that gonna mean on a tax bill? Okay, assume it was, assuming it was assessed at a, at a, million, at a million dollars. Right, uh, but we're, I'm thinking about our new teachers that are moving to town, et cetera. Correct. That would be an increase of $600 per year. If it was a, I'm sorry, if you were $60 times 10, because it's 10 times $100,000 per, um, $60 per $100,000, so. So that's option A. That's option A. Okay. Option B is um, 300 and, um, sorry. That's okay. Uh, $320. Ongoing, or you said something about oh, just the first four years? First four years. And then after the first four years, then it would go up back up to $60? No. Then after four years, it would fall up under option A. It would fall down to um, roughly um, half of that, so $300 in your example. In option three, that number would continue, that $300 would continue. So the only thing we're really talking about is the four years at the beginning it would be roughly $60 per $100. Under option three, it would be roughly $32 for four years. And then after that, they are roughly the same. Okay. That's the difference. Okay, not much of a savings in. Okay, so... No doubt about it, Pajaro Valley High School needs equity. And um, when we championed the first bond, 150 million at that time, so I'm gonna ask a number of questions here. At that time, what they told us in the, in the overall needs assessment is that we needed about 300 million to fix basic needs across the district. So I see that now we've jumped up to 1.2 billion. So I'm guessing that's not just basic needs, but that might be all needs in the district in terms of what's needed in, for repairs or upgrades or modernization. So that's a great question. So I will start off answering and then I will um, have uh, Serge and Hurley come up to assess. So essentially what happened with the original um, facility master plan um, from 2012, to 2022 is um, the scale and scope of uh, the projects were different at that time. So if we go back, um, if you look at that original facility master plan, a lot of the costs in there and the estimated projects were really renovating um, and repairing the facilities that we had. So for example, roofing. Um, you tour the sites and you can see that the roofs are not in good condition. In the original facility master plan, um, a lot of the repairs were just um, coating with sealant versus actually repairing. As, as we all know with, um, with facilities, you start off with a small crack. Over time, it gets bigger and then maybe the floors have to be replaced where there's rot in their walls. So as we can kind of start to see, um, when you don't take care of facilities um, right off the bat, the need grows exponentially. So that's one part. Another part is in the original master plan, um, it was really repairing the existing portables, the aging portables. And in this new master plan, we are looking to move away from them because they're already approaching the end of their um, lifespan. A lot of them are more than twice the usable lifespan. So instead of saying we're going to continue to repair them or just replace them, we're saying let's move towards um, permanent classrooms. So about, I believe, around 
400 million of that 1.2 billion is um, do, is related to those costs. Um, and just prices of uh, projects have increased in the last decade. Um, I think when we when we did some research, um, it's estimated due to inflation about 20% increase. And that 1.2 billion um, is total need um, across the district. So. Um, usually, it's uh, it's typical for a master plan to be three to five times the amount that a district will go out for a bond, and within that plan gives us the opportunity then to, as a school community, start prioritizing what projects we want to um, work on first to get to kind of that end goal. Thank you. Um, okay, so under Measure L with 150 million, um, we were told. Um, during deliberations just like this, that we would be that our district would be eligible to receive a match from the state um, for shovel ready projects in particular, but and also for some of our big projects had they already been approved through DSA. Do you, do you have any? And I know Jenny, you're you've just sort of taken over in this position, but do you have any sense of how much we received in matching grants from the last? set of state projects? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can okay. certainly get that to you. Okay, mm -hmm. because I know what happened last time is we were all expecting and we were in line, we submitted mm -hmm. those projects um, to the state, but there were so many other big um, districts that got in line ahead of us that by the time it got to us, I think they were pretty much out of money and I'm not sure we ever got the reimbursement and I would like to know that very definitively. If we're still, how much we got, if we're still waiting for some of those matches mm -hmm. and do we have anything in the pipeline that's still waiting in that long queue with all the other districts around the state? I can definitely look that up for you. Okay, so this might be a question for Dale now. Um, so. In terms of a project like the auditorium for Pajaro Valley High School, what what kind of match could we get? Because it sounds like it's already approved through DSA, maybe just needs an update or something. Yeah, this is not really my level of expertise, to be honest. I will tell you the state match fund, um, you will qualify. Qualifying is not the biggest issue. Receiving is the biggest issue. Yeah. Um, and you've already noted it. Um, there are, um, unfortunately, no great um, indicators of when you'll receive those funds um, or if you'll receive those funds in the current budget environment. Um, it's unfortunate, but I wish I could give you a more definitive voice on that. You can assume you can get, you can qualify for a very large amount, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll receive it in good order and in good speed. Okay. So you heard what my questions were. How much did we receive? Are we, did we get anything? Are we still in line? And moving forward. I think, since I was up in Sacramento, what I think I understood was that the governor is proposing state bond measure for the November election as well for, for education facilities. So we would be able to then submit many of these projects, I think, for reimbursement. But I'd like to do it very quickly <laughs> and get things underway so that we can get in line for some of this money, which would make our bond go much, uh, much further in the district. Yes, absolutely. And then, I almost never um, address things that are said here in the audience, but I just have to agree with Francisco Rodriguez um, that our schools are the hearts of our neighborhoods. And I too, 20 years ago, was on the Aptos High campus running around the track with my two-year-old on her big wheel, and I got locked in by m and and had to scale a six or seven foot fence with a two-year-old to get out because I was stuck there. there were, we, I, I don't think there was no service and there still isn't any service up there. So I do feel like our campuses are the hearts of our neighborhood and should be open to our children and families to use in off times. I understand that's very hard. I know at that particular school that he's talking about that we've had um, problems with people that are unhoused and um, people um, vandalizing and leaving needles and that kind of thing in those areas. So I understand the, the need for security and for locking campuses after a certain time, but really those campuses should be open so families could use them. The taxpayers are paying for those campuses 
and our, our community should be able to access them in the off times. And then finally, um, a question about the projects at Pajaro Valley High School. I wanna make sure that those get done first. If this bond passes, we need that pool and we need that auditorium. So to the general public, um, we did have a plan to put your auditorium in at Pajaro Valley High School very early, but because of many factors, the price of building went up very, very quickly and we could no longer afford to do both your track and field, build that out and do your performing arts center. So we owe you that and if this bond passes, I wanna make sure that that project goes in first. Thank you. Is that all, Trustee DeSerpa? I think so. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else from the board? Any further elaboration? Um, okay, I just wanna thank you all for a very um, well thought out and good presentation. This was much better than what we had had previously. I wanna commend my two colleagues, both Trustee DeSerpa and Trustee Dodge Jr. for requesting that we um, table this and bring this item back. Um, I do have some questions because there were comments made by district administration staff that night and we have had a significant change in district administration staff since, um, cautioning um, the, a presentation such as this that was demonstrating the need which the, um, us as the seven member trustees who tour these sites and see them have that first hand intimate knowledge of the need but not really necessarily does the whole general public. Um, so, but in that night, the comments made by district admin that night were cautioning us about having such a presentation with these recommendations of the need as though they were commitments. It, it, I'm not sure if this would be for Mr. Scott or the board's legal counsel to speak on. It, it, can you elaborate on that? concern. So um, if I could maybe um, <clears throat> uh, make a comment. I, I believe that night um, it was more cautioning against setting um, a whole list of priorities because I think before we get further into getting all of the necessary community input, um, we didn't want to um, prioritize across multiple sites. I think um, with this, we, we were very clear that we were establishing kind of the need and kind of showing a vision of where we wanted to go by showing example projects that we have commit, uh, completed. And I think with PV High, um, with especially their PAC, um, I think across the board um, with administration, Dr. Contreras, with the board and the school community, that is absolutely um, a number one priority. So we wanted to kind of make that clear as, as a marquee project going into this. Uh, good evening, trustees, uh, Superintendent Dr. Contreras. Uh, Dan Marucci, Elizondo Smith. Um, if I could maybe recharacterize your question or, or ask for a clarification. I think what you're asking for is what, what really is the function of a project list in this in this context? Does it, does it describe a, you know, a a, a promise that that the district is going to undertake each and every one of those projects, or is it something else? Is that is that a fair? I think so, and I believe when this conversation started um, with the district's previous administration, um, not our interim administration, but the previous permanent superintendent, um, there was a huge focus on teacher housing per se. Mm -hmm. So again, coming back right because. I, myself and two of my colleagues, for instance, sit on the Mellow Center um, Committee. It's a JPA that we have with the city of Watsonville. The city of Watsonville had told us some under the prior district administration that they would commit a million dollars to that JPA if we would match it. The prior district administration didn't see the need to do that but it is a 30-year-old building, it's dilapidated, it has needs. So if we were to say we're going to commit, if let's say the city were willing to still commit their a million to us, that we do maybe a 0.1% or something of this to that. I mean, so in other words, 
we're not stating that these are specific things we're going to do. It's just that these are needs to be clear because there was also some backlash and I, I wasn't on the board back then with the Measure L that a CBO that we had at the time was going around to the community committing certain things, particularly around PB High being the newest high school that we, or the youngest one that we have. And that it took years to get to there and we're still not completely there. So I, I just don't want the public feeling sort of, um, for lack of a better word, maybe bamboozled, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that we're saying these are the things we're doing. And I don't think we're at the point where we even have the right or authority as a board to do that. Can yeah, fair. And I, and yeah, and I, and I think that's right. Um, well, the, the function of the project list, the function of the measure is to put in front of the voters um, a request for the authority, right? But that authority comes with, comes with strings, and this is a function of Proposition 39 and not the traditional general obligation bond authority. That string, or one of them anyways, one of the accountability measures that's baked into Prop 39 is that the measure describe with specificity what the universe of projects are that they are allowing bond proceeds to be to, to finance, okay? Um, as to each and every individual project, that will come back to the board for its approval individually. So um, while if the, if the voters approve the measure, what this is is an authority for the district to finance any one of those projects that are on the project list. It describes the universe of things that the voters are allowing the district to finance. And anything outside of that universe is not something that the district can use bond funds for. But I think maybe more particular to your question is that uh, you will have an opportunity, this board, the board is gonna have an opportunity each and every instance when a project is proposed. And the board will have an opportunity to approve this project first before this project, set a set of priorities in place if it wishes, but it doesn't have to do that. Uh, so really this is, these are decisions that the board will make. And um, to your point about maybe school site administration or someone not the board that does not carry with it the board's delegated power, um, only the board, the board has sole discretion over those matters, sole. Um, and so any, any promises outside or made by something or someone other than the board is, is, is not an enforceable promise on the board. Does that make sense? It, it does, I just okay. wanted to make sure we had the, the clear elaboration um, on that. Um, so, and again, when you're talking about those recommendations, you're not just talking about the recommendations of the needs that were presented here tonight, you're talking no. about anything in that Prop 39. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, the way, the way that I, you know, the, the facilities master plan um, is, it describes a larger universe of what your facilities needs district-wide are. This and the project list is what the board is preparing to ask the voters to approve to finance, right? And that is a smaller, if you think about a Venn diagram, that's a smaller circle within that larger facilities master plan universe of need. These are the, these are the projects that you've chosen to say, these are the ones that are important to us right now. These are the ones that we can bite off and chew. These are the ones that we could finance based on what the tax base is, and this is what we're bringing to the, to the voters. Okay, I appreciate that elaboration. Um, I have another question, Ms. M. I think it's with regards to the portables, and you've talked about that, about the term out. Um, and that some of them are past the double life capacity. Because I do believe, and I think this falls into the Prop 39, correct, with the facilities use, like we can only use portables for an X, Y, and Z amount of time, correct? I mean, they have a lifespan they for, have for a school lifespan. structures. Sorry, I'm going to have Sergio and Breeze come up and speak more on that. So they do have a lifespan, right? So, for example, we have portables that 
when they go to their 20 years, then we have to remodel those portables to get another 20 years. Mm. And then we have to do the same thing after 20 years. So the infrastructure is staying. Every time we go with the portable, then we have to make sure that, for example, the plumbing, right, the electrical. So everything has to pretty much come to 88 upgrades and site um, upgrades and meet the standards from DSA. So that's how we've been continuing to stretch them beyond their lifespan. Correct. And that's just the same way with roofs, right? If we put a coating in a roof, it's only going to buy you, say, 10 years. Right. Well, we're already past those 10 years, so now it's, we actually need to replace the whole roof. Okay. Thank you. So uh, coming back to my, I guess it's a bit to my question, this list that's been prepared for tonight uh, that we're saying is what we're presenting to the voters is the list of what the district's identified as priority needs. So is it possible to add anything to that at this point, such as the Mellow Center, if the city was still willing to match the million dollars on the JPA? So um, I believe on the resolution, um, we can certainly look at what the broad uses are. Um, do you happen to know specifically for the Mellow Center? Um, I, sorry. Um, the, the, I was not the architect of the, of the project list. I'm, I'm here as general counsel, but I do serve as bond counsel for many school districts up and down the state, some neighbors of yours in, in, in Monterey County. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at the project list and from my opinion tell you, but I can tell you specifically, um, but I can tell you that there's really, you know, two bites at the apple. And the way that project lists are usually um, prepared is to both address uh, what we know as the specific needs of today and also um, those general articulation of projects that we anticipate that we might need but we don't really know the specifics of. The reason for that, the necessary reason for that is that you heard the, the figure for the next 10 years before, right, in, in, in the context of this presentation. It may very well take that long to get through your authorization. You can't issue it all at once. You have to let your tax base recover because we have some limitations on what the tax rate is going to be, what the debt cap is, things like that. So as we pay off outstanding debt that gives us a little bit more room as the tax base grows that gives, gives us a little bit more room as well. Um, all that to say that a, a project list should be specific and also flexible so that it, it can address your needs um, as you go through your bond program. Um, my guess is I would like to know a little bit more about that, about that particular project. Um, but I, and, and maybe this is a better question for Dale to, because he probably understands the, the project list a little bit better than I. My guess, however, and I can, I can confirm that, is that it, there is probably flexibility for that. Okay. I'll let Dale. Uh, there is. <laughs> this is a short answer. Um, so I wouldn't worry about any of the projects that have been discussed or any of the projects. Or that weren't so. discussed. Or that weren't discussed. There's broad flexibility. The point of the project list is to not is to give people a context for which to work upon, but you're going to have uh, the ability to do any project uh, that you could see, conceive of as a board that would be an educational facility. And then, Mr. Scott, you could probably answer this question because I know I've had this conversation with Dr. Contreras. We've talked about if, if this is passed by the board tonight and then if it's passed by the voters. And we've talked about rising cost, inflation, and also rising costs on interest rates and how that can also sort of dwindle away, right? Can you speak to the sort of truths about and the facts of how about that and how that happens, that we can approve the option A, but down the road we really don't have that full amount. If I'm summarizing that correctly, somewhat, not meaning to put you on the spot. No, I'm happy to answer <laughs> it. It's fairly simple. The impact of interest rates on the borrowing is not that great. The impact on the borrowing or the amount that's approved by voters is the inflation rate. 
not the inflation rate that's the national inflation rate, the inflation rate of your construction. Um, I was working with the district recently. They did not uh, spend their money as quickly as they probably should have. They thought they had $40 million. Three years later, I said, you don't have $40 million anymore. You have $30 million. You have $30 million of dollars that you can actually spend. $40 million, sure, you can go out and spend it, but you can't get $40 million worth of projects now. That's the real power. That's why waiting for two or three years is going to be so difficult for you, because it's going to be the same thing. You're not going to be looking at $300 million, you're going to be looking at $500 million. It's that impact of the compounding effect of inflation. And particularly like, for instance, with Pajaro Valley High and where it sits, and all the different entities that are involved with projects, including airport, city, um, CEQA, I mean, the list goes on. I could see that as... Coastal Commission. Coastal Commission, thank you. I mean, again, the list can go on. Um, that that can impact that as well, correct? Because it's not like we could just say, we want to do this and we're going to do it. It's yeah. all these layers. Understood. I will give you my, my quick read. Um, the ability to spend bond dollars, I don't care what district you were in, the ability to spend don, bond dollars never goes as quickly as you hope. Never. It's always, gosh, we have all this money. How come we can't spend it? It's because of the very things you just said. The work that has to be done, the pre-work. Then you begin to spend it, and it's, whoo, it's like, where did all that money go so quickly? It goes really fast. And that's what you're going to have to be able to get those projects moving as quickly as possible to get them out the door um, uh, immediately. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there two years later saying, gosh, I thought we had this amount of money, but we don't. And what kind of time frame, it's provided this is approved in November and the election is certified the 28, 30 days later, how quick could this district move in that direction? Uh, you could start, you could have money available um, in January of 2026. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, 2025, not 2026. Yes, 2025. 2025. All right. Yeah. So you know, getting the money is the easy part. It's the spending part that's hard. It's getting, you know, getting it on the ballot, getting it approved, getting it spent. The, acquiring the funds is not that difficult. All right. I thank sure. you and appreciate all of you for enduring all of our questions. This is a Trustee very important talk. At Acosta, yes. President Acosta, I have just two more questions. Sure, go ahead. Sure. I want to talk about workforce housing for a second. So I saw the proposed rents for those units, a studio, a one bedroom, a two bedroom. I thought they were very high. Yeah, are there programs out there? Could we collaborate with the housing authority or other programs to to enter into some type of programs that would make it more affordable for our teachers? Well, to be clear, you as a board are the only of uh, the only authority that actually sets those rents. Uh, those numbers that you saw were put in on a pro forma basis to show you what the program looks like. You as a board decided: is it going to be sixty percent? Is it going to be fifty percent? Is it going to be seventy percent? That's your okay. That's your decision. And then the, one one idea that I had heard from another district somewhere around. Um, during my board service is that they had workforce housing and they put aside a portion of what normally would be rent into a trust fund for for every teacher that was living in, in these units so that after six or seven years when the teachers were ready to move on they had a down payment so they could buy something. Mm. It's been discussed it's, a great deal. I'm unaware of any district actually having done that. Okay. Um, but it has been under consideration by a number of districts. Is it a legal thing that we could do if we wanted to do that? Yeah, it's yeah. legal. Great. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's it. I had one more, but I've forgotten now. Thank no you. worries if it comes back to you. Thank you, Trustee to serve. Trustee Bolano Scow. I uh, also want to thank my fellow trustees for their good questions. Just one point, I think, to your point, President Costa, about entities around PV High. My understanding with the Coastal Act is that the Watsonville City Council is the arbiter of the Coastal Act as it pertains to projects. And so it's just important for us to have great relations with the council and the city and going forward, which I, which I think we'll have. But I just thought the audience should know that. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scout. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions, discussion, deliberation? Trustee DeSerpa? Um, 
I don't know if it's possible, but we have a member of the building trades here who put a speaker card in and he was out in the hallway when his name was called. I don't know if you would consider I, it. Yes, and I spoke with the board secretary and his name was called um, three times and I'm sorry. Okay, thank We're you. We're past public comment on the topic, I'm sorry. Anyone else? Any discussions, deliberation? Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, to, just quickly, so what? So if this bond is approved in November, so it falls on MNO to start working right away? <laughs> in January 2025, what, what I thought I heard? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So um, if, we, if we look at the current slide up on, on the screen, so in between now and November, we would um, uh, fine tune um, and work more with the community to, to finalize the facility master plan. Um, after voters uh, vote in November, hopefully it passes. Um, and as soon as that passes, we can essentially start um, our planning work. Um, even though we don't receive the funds until January, we would be able to start getting um, some of the processes started. Well, it, it, you know, no pressure, but I believe, I believe in our team. So I just wanted to say, say thank you. Thank you, um, and I just reserved um, further elaboration from the board secretary. So, Mr. Casey Van Den Hugo, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, hopefully you're in here this time. Correct, yes, could you come up? You put in a speaker card for a minute, and we'll give you your minute, sir. I put one in too, and you didn't call me. Thank you, Board. I really appreciate that. I had to step out for an emergency. I'm here to speak to you tonight on education. As a board, I know you value education quite a bit, and I know the students in public here value education very well. So the adult education program here in Watsonville has a building trades pre-apprenticeship training class. It's a six-week course that provides training to people that are seeking trade careers. And by providing that training, we need to provide jobs for those students graduating that pre-apprenticeship. And if we're gonna ask the community to put up money for this bond, and we are training these, this next generation in these jobs for the construction industry, let's guarantee them this work. Per the DIR, you are required to have 20% of all of your projects in every classification being done by a state certified apprenticeship. Watsonville has one of the highest concentrations. Thank you very much. Do Dr. Baraha, I conferred with the um, board's secretary. You can go up ahead and come on up and we'll give you your minute. I'd just like to remind members of the public, as I noted in the beginning, Speaker cards do need to be submitted prior to the agenda item starting, but thank you and welcome. Thank you. I am glad that this is happening, but I also noticed that there was nothing for safety at PV. There's only one entrance in the entire school where the kids walk. It's very unsafe. I don't know if you've driven by there, but uh, it's very unsafe. There's, there's so many. I'm surprised more kids haven't been hit by cars. And I'm just thinking, what would happen if that entrance was blocked, if something happened? How would we get to our kids? How would the kids get out? And I'm really surprised that that didn't take priority over beautification of schools. While it would be nice to have beautiful schools, that's not really a priority. Safety is a priority. And so you guys really need to rethink that because I worry for those kids every day. There's just one exit. Who thought of that? That was the most ridiculous thing, have one exit. It's blocked, and then how do I get to my kids? So please rethink that. That's really important. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> okay, so we have had a motion, a second. We've had time for deliberation. Is there any last comments from the board before I call for a vote? Seeing none, I'm gonna call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries uh, 601. Thank you. Thank you.
I will now move us to um, item, and again, thank you to all those that came to this evening to present on that. Um, I will now move us to item 9.1, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please note that though the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, we are listening. Per the board's policy adopted in June 2021, the board can limit public comment to a total of 30 minutes. However, in order to not limit the number of public speakers and in order to provide every public speaker with the opportunity to speak, each public speaker will have one minute. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. So I will call up six people in the cards that I was given. So the first six are Trina Kaufman Gomez, Patsy Garcia, I'm sorry. <laughs> Martha Denny, Ashley Monroy, Isaiah Barrera, and Takashi Mizuno. Marcus said go, right? Hi, good, good evening. This is Trina Kaufman Gomez, former city council member. And what I have for you in front of me is a check. And this was a check purposely for the soccer fields at Pajaro Middle School. This is as a result of our Rotary Club of Freedoms donation towards the project that your former superintendent encouraged Rotarians to participate and get involved and engaged. So it's uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Contreras, that's here. We also have other relief efforts that we're doing for the Pajaro Middle School that we'll be talking about. Uh, one of the programs is Ambassadors of Compassion, so we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, also want to encourage uh, what we have going on for the scouting program. I think that uh, we've, we've been supporting that with the youth in our community. And we also will be supporting the 5K run that will be the Strawberry Jam. So we look forward to having the school district out there participating for helping out with the schools. And I concur about opening up the schools. We have no parks in this community. We need those schools open. That's how I was raised and enjoyed. So here's your money. Uh, thank you. If our Director of Fiscal Services can take responsibility for the check, we trust her 100%. Plus. Plus. Thanks, Trina. Hi, my thank name you. Is... Good evening. Yes. Thank you very I am also a Freedom Rotarian. Uh, my day job is with the American Red Cross and the disaster manager covering Santa Cruz Monterey. And um, uh, the relief efforts that we have been doing since day one when Pajaro flooded, we continue to support the community of Pajaro, which is very important. I hope one of the priority schools is also uh, Pajaro Middle School. While it's starting to get beautified, they need a lot more, including this training that we are offering the school to be brought in, which is really important, helps build uh, the students up so that uh, with the transition, the trauma they faced being coming out of their home, their school, which is also considered a second home, and helping them bridge that with coming back into the community and into their school again. So um, we thank you very much. The American Red Cross continues to be there. Everything from installing smoke alarms for replacement houses as people are coming back in, and we'll be there until the need is over, which, you know, it's all the time, right? So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Board of Trustees. My name is Ashley Monroy, and I am a senior at Pajaro Valley High School. Today, I am standing up here to advocate on why PV High should have a theater arts built and dedicated in a building instead of a classroom. First, a dedicated theater building provides the right environment. Theater requires space for rehearsals, performances, set constructions, and technical work like lighting and sound. A classroom simply can't accommodate these needs. Second, it enhances learning and creativity. A proper theater space would allow students to fully engage in the creative process with the right tools and atmosphere to inspire their better work. This leads to a higher quality productions and a better educational experience. Third, safety and pra practicality it matter builds building sets, handling props, and using technical equipment require safe and well-designed space. A theater building ensures students can sh work safely and efficiently, which isn't possible in a standard classroom. Finally, it boosts school spirits and community involvement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, my name is Isaiah, and I go I attend PV High School. I'm a senior, and I feel like something that we need to address is like, for example, what she said about trafficking with school traffic. One entrance and one exit, it's not, it's not good, you know? I've already seen multiple kids, you know, get hit, and I'm not lying because I've seen it with my own eyes. And um, that's what I say, like, there's no safety in that school. Like, there's no one in the bottom taking care of the students. There's no one. And, like, Watsonville High School, you know, they got cops down there. They got, you know, one cop. PV High School doesn't have anything. So that's, you know, what I was thinking in my head. There should be at least someone down there, a teacher, uh, anyone, taking care of those kids down there. And that's it for me. Thank you. Good evening, and I'm Takashi, and uh, I'm District 2. And uh, I met Professor Allison in person for the first time last uh, Monday. And I was so much impressed with her presentation. I have studied multicultural education and ethnic studies for many years and taught and practiced it. But I'm, I was so impressed, and I'd like to share what she said. I quote, ethnic studies so much about collective liberation. Ethnic collective liberation is not just about uh, freeing people of color, but freeing all people, including Jewish people, from oppression and exploring the intersections of different groups. It's so impressive. Why don't, don't we put our efforts to learn from her? This is my message to you tonight, except Dr. Jennifer Horum, who joined our town hall meeting. You were invited, but you chose not to attend. I wonder why. The, ne the next six speakers are Leonardo Lopez Silva, Juan Moreno, Jose Alvalado, Ashley Colonel, Evelyn Rincon, and Damaris Padilla. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Trustees. Um, today I'd like to discuss a topic that's been talked about today a lot. Um, uh, it's an auditorium at Paja Valley High School. Um, so for years we've really wished for an auditorium a space that's really been missed uh, at PV for events and performances. A lot, it's an essential venue for our schools and across the nation. Um, unlike schools like Watsonville, we lack this. Um, picture how our Flocorico program, um, bursting with talent and culture, can flourish with a dedicated space uh, for rehearsals and showcases. Uh, moreover, uh, an auditorium would also alleviate logistical challenges during major events like the award ceremony and scholarship ceremony that was being held earlier this afternoon in the gym. Um, having an auditorium will ensure that we enjoy smooth ceremonies without any logistical hiccups or technical. Um, with our own menu, we have the freedom to host diverse activities um, fostering a stronger sense of community within our school. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Juan Moreno. I am a student at Parra Valley High School. And first things first, why build another school when you guys can't, when you, we can't keep them fully staffed? Uh, there's classes where we have to go from substitute to substitute every week. We see a different phase. And us students need to go from classroom to classroom. We're not learning anything. We're going from packet to packet. We're not learning anything at all. I'm just asking for us to get permanent teachers, not saying just throw anybody in that class. We want teachers who are well educated, who could actually teach us something in that subject. Thank you. Good evening, trustees. My name is Jose Alvarado, a senior and student at Pajaro Valley High School. You guys heard this a million times already but it won't stop until it's done. I wanted to touch up on the topic about having a theater at our school. I may not be there for much longer, but what matters is that it benefits the upcoming high school students that will be attending PVI. 
I think we can all agree that our high school neighbors having a theater and PV High not having one isn't fair whatsoever. We have to work with Baltimore High schedule to be able to have our own performances. We've had to have performances in the school cafeteria just because we don't have our personal theater. Equality should play a role and we shouldn't have to be compared to these other schools for not having something as simple as a theater. Hopefully sooner or later, we're seen as equal and upcoming PV High students have the benefit of having this much needed building. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashley Coronel. I'm a senior attending Pajaro Valley High. I want to speak about building a theater and provide a pool for PV. Watsonville High and Aptos High get their own pool. We already lost former PV students due to drowning. Why? Because PV doesn't provide a pool for swimming lessons. It is not fair. Why does Watsonville have two gyms? Maybe we could have used that money that went towards the new gym to building the pool or even a theater. Band and drama class have, have a hard time finding a place to perform, perform because their only options are the gym, maybe the library or the cafeteria or even the wrestling room, which, is, isn't, which isn't really good um, options. And also they have to work with Watsonville's high schedule to perform, so please take consideration for what PV students wish to have on an unfinished campus. Thank you for your time. Hello, good, e good evening. My name is Evelyn Rincon and I'm currently attending Pajaro Valley High School as a senior. I am here today to comment about a topic I'm hoping it will be looked into in the future, which is providing a theater room that will allow our drama and band students to play and practice their roles in. This will not only give the privacy the students need to practice, but it will also benefit our current and future students that will be taking the classes. By having our own, it will avoid from Avoid them from figuring out where and when they can use a theater that's not ours. Overall, we will all appreciate if you can make this happen. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Amaris Padilla, and I attend Pajaro Valley High. Today, I am here advocating for one of the facilities PV is lacking, which is a pool. I know you will be voting on submitting another bond proposal for the November election. If the community approves it, I urge you to consider using part of the money to build a pool at PV High. PV is the only high school in this district that doesn't have a pool. It makes no sense how other schools have a complete campus, but PV doesn't. I strongly believe that PV needs a pool facility. Bringing a pool to PV can be so beneficial in many different ways. Firstly, it provides an opportunity for students to learn how to swim, which is a valuable life skill especially after losing a PV alumni to drowning. I highly believe that if we would have had a pool and swimming courses, that could have prevented the terrible accident. So today I am here asking you to consider building a pool facility for PV. Thank you. The next six public speakers are Brittany Rodriguez, Bill Beecher, Yesenia Mercado, Mark Mendoza Lengua, Lengua, Lengas. Uh, right here I just have Maria, 522-24, and Gabriel Reyes. Um, hi, my name is Brittany Rodriguez and I am also a PV student. Today I will continue and add to what my classmate that Maris has already said. I believe that future Grizzly students should have the opportunity to enjoy a new facility like a pool. I believe a pool can be very beneficial for students. For example, having a pool on campus provides our school with more physical activities. They can participate in swimming classes, water aerobics, or even join swim teams. Fostering an active lifestyle and community, a pool can also serve a recreational space allowing students to relax and unwind during breaks or after school. Lastly, a pool can be utilized for educational purposes or such as hosting water safety workshops or incorporating aquatic exercises into physical education classes. So you should consider using part of a new bond to build a pool facility at PV. Thank you for your time.
Good evening. I have requested through the superintendent to add an agenda item for a class on ethnic diversity of the Paro Valley. I would hope that you would put this on the future agenda. I and others believe that you need it. For over 17 years, I have made numerous agenda requests, as have other public members. Not once do I know that any of them were ever used. From my perspective, that's a violation of the intent of the Brown Act to give the public a chance to make inputs into this board. You're not alone. Other public entities also freeze out the public. Only the County Office of Education has allowed me to speak. Consequently, with considerable regret, I will file a Brown Ag violation against the Pajaro Valley School District in June. Shame on you. You exist to serve the community and our students, not just yourself. Good afternoon, board trustees. My name is Yesenia Mercado. I'm a senior at Pajaro Valley High School. I want to take this opportunity and talk about an issue that has, has to be resolved, that being not having enough staff for example, I haven't had an English teacher for these past two years. I haven't had the opportunity to get the support I need when it comes to English, and I feel like other students feel the same way. I don't, I don't want upcoming students to feel the struggle that I'm going through. We need more teachers that have a teacher credential, and I think it will make a huge difference at our school. And students will get the support, the support they need when it comes to English class. I hope you take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. Hello, board members. I am here once again. What I should be doing currently is working on my final projects, but no, I'm here talking to a little wall, trying to get my voice heard. It seems that at this point, students are better at doing your guys' jobs than the actual board members. This is a wake-up call to the board. Do your job. We know the board wants to silence the youth, but we will not back down until we are given what's rightfully ours, which is our education. On the same topic, PVHS is being denied of basic school needs. Where is our auditorium and our swimming pool? Give PVHS what they deserve. The PVH, PVHS competition ban won first place at a huge ban competition, not once, but twice. This should be a wake-up call to give PVH, PVHS what they deserve. I want to quote my favorite band, Pierce the Veil. I'm tired of begging for the things that I want. Students should not be begging for basic needs and their education. They should not stand here begging to adults who won't listen. Bring back CRE and justice for PVHS. <laughs> Um, I, my name is Maria Garcia, and I'm from Watsonville High School, and I think she said basically everything I wanted to say. I don't think it's fair how we're still here, and finals are coming up, and we're supposed to be working on that, and we're here instead. So I'm going to be up until, this was supposed to end around 9. It's going to be around here until 9.30, 10, I don't know. But I'm tired of coming and seeing no progress. It just keeps going and going and going, and I'm kind of just tired of seeing what's going on with the board meeting and how we're not doing, nothing's really changing. And I just think it's kind of, kind of dumb, huh? <laughs> just kind of dumb. I don't know. Thank you. Hi, hello. My name is Gabriel Reyes. Um, I'm currently a student at Paro Valley High School. Um, I like to talk about not us not having a a pool. I think we need a pool at Paro Valley High School. We're actually the the high school in the district that doesn't have a pool, and I think we need one. And I think it should benefit any student that takes it, and it would help any of us. That's all. The next six public speakers are Jose, Teresa Quiroz, uh, Eli Rimero, Carol Turley, Bobby Pels, and Natalie. Good evening, my name is Teresa Quiroz, and I'm here to address an important issue. Pajaro Valley High School, 
desperately needs a theater. Currently, our theater productions significant events like the awards night happening in our gym today lack a proper venue. Our students deserve to receive their awards and be celebrated by their families on a real stage, not in a school gym. Moreover, as a member of the Folklorico class, I find it disheartening to perform in a room with a 35-person capacity instead of a theater. Our performing arts students are incredibly talented and deserve a dedicated space to showcase their skills. Performing in a cafeteria or a wrestling room does not do justice to their hard work and creativity. A theater will not only provide a suitable venue for performances and events, but also elevate the overall experience for both performers and the audience. It would greatly benefit the students of PBHS, offering them a space that matches their talents and dedication. Uh, my name is Jose, and I'm a senior at PV High School, and I'm here to talk about the needs about PV and what can be improved. First, PV needs more programs like more classes, electives, and sport facilities. What PV also needs is more security for, more, for a more safer campus so students f feel protected and safer. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Natalie Rivera. I am a senior at Pajaro Valley High School. The class I lacked to have the full credential instructor was English 4, and this went on for over a year, and for other students, two years. Over this year, I did not get the proper education the system expects. We did not engage with one another. All was expected of us was to make origami boxes and listen to a substitute rant about their life. A per, um, and person, personally, this has impacted me on getting new writing skills for college and future jobs. It's unfair for students to not have a proper teacher to guide us to success. I hope you all take the time to go to the schools and see the problems that go on. And I want to thank Bridget Phantom, an ethnic studies teacher, for taking over the English for class over this year. This year. Thank you. Good evening, trustees. My name is Carol Turley. Um, this past week, I had the opportunity to visit two ethnic studies classes at Watsonville High School. And I was so impressed by the students in this class and the engagement. They're seniors. Um, they really have it going on. And I think many of them would attribute that to the things that they have learned and the comfort that they have in their ethnic studies classes. Um, and I strongly encourage you to look again at the CRE program and bring that back for the final, final year of training. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Bobby Pelt, Watsonville High. Uh, I'm here to speak again on the CRE contract. Uh, Dr. Contreras, I want you to know that I've spoken on this issue at every single board meeting since the contract was not renewed in September. It's been a long and hard year, but I'm grateful. I've seen the speeches of folks of all ages, eighth grade to retired, folks of many ethnicities coming in every shade, folks of multiple religions, including Jews, folks who were born here and folks who immigrated here, folks who speak English and folks who speak Spanish, folks of the LGBTQ community and folks with disabilities, like me. I've seen a beautiful community rise up in solidarity to defend ethnic studies and the CRE organization. And for that, I'm grateful. So to the three people, and only three, who spoke out against CRE, and the four board members who stubbornly refused to bring it back, I said thank you. In your efforts to deny us, you brought us all together. Support ethnic studies. Bring back CRE. Good evening, board. My name is Eli Romero, and I'm a senior at Watson High School. And I just want to say uh, we need CRE contract back just because we see how ethnic studies bring a community together, especially here in Watsonville where like the majority are Latinos or Hispanic or people from marginalized communities. So we need ethnic studies to show the people that they can have the power and go rule the world. How do you want like them to rule Watsonville if they don't know how to run, how to they don't know how to have the power in their hands. Also, thank you to Dr. Holmes, who showed to the Agnes Studies Town Hall. We really appreciate uh, your support and to be there with us. With your, we are your supporters, and we we're looking forward to see you in more events like this. And also, thank you to Dr. Contreras, who showed up today at the. 
Pride flag raised at the district office. It's really nice to see people who are for the community. Thank you so much. The next six speakers are Daniel Guzman, Noemi Romero, Julio Gonzalez, Ellie Davies, and Tammy Harkins, I believe, teacher, PBHS. Hello, uh, people of the board. My name is Daniel. I am a senior at PV High, and for two years straight, I had my English classes taught by an unqualified sub. Everything was pointless and enduring and infuriating since nothing got taught. Now a question I have is why, why we were allowed to be with an unqualified person for so long. Why aren't teachers applying to our district? You know why I think teachers aren't applying? It's because Santa Cruz County is the number one worst country to, county to live in a in as a teacher according to a study presented in USA Today. Apparently Santa Cruz County ranks as the least affordable place to live for teachers where experienced teacher salaries average around $67,000 before taxes with 66 percent with of that going to rent. Teachers can make ten to twenty thousand dollars more going in other places right off the bat. In order to attract teachers you need to increase the pay so they can afford residency. Another thing I can suggest is increasing awareness about the opportunities for students and teachers here and then you actually have to make sure that there are opportunity students and for, for students and teachers here, not just lying to them. You also need to make sure you're listening to student voices about what we see as opportunity. I would mention other concerns, That's but due to your one abuse of power, I can only say so much with the time given. Good day. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Julio Gonzalez, and I'm here to advocate for the prioritization of a auditorium. I'm a drama student here at PV, and every morning, for whenever we have a play, we have to set up the stage in a wrestling room. And some, sometimes during live performances, students fall off the stage, and that, that can, people can get injured. And I just find it ridiculous that we don't have our own personal auditorium to be in. Uh, a multi-purpose auditorium could be very useful for many students, uh, like our folklorico students, um, cheer as well. And I just think that it's a, it's a problem. I mean, we, we have to set up the Folklorico stage every time for a performance. And uh, on one of these posters we made, there's some photos of students' arms after setting up the stage. Um, they're irritated and uh, scratched. And I just, our teacher works really hard to get everything to work with the limited resources that we have. Thank you. Hello trustees, my name is Noemi. I am part of the theater arts program. I think we would really benefit about an, with an auditorium. Um, I invite you guys actually to come see us perform tomorrow. Our, we are doing three shows to see the setup that we are working with. The first show starts at 9.15, the second one at 12.10, and the third one at 2.45. Kids have fallen off that stage and the stress that our teacher goes through just to bring this to our school is ridiculous, and I think he shouldn't, he doesn't deserve that. Thank you. Board, over 200 public comments have been given in support of CRE. What we've heard many times is speakers urging the board to take ethnic studies classes. This is not an insult. As an educational body, a call to educate is a call for understanding. I want to thank Dr. Jennifer Holm for being the only member of the board to come to our Ethnic Studies Town Hall on Monday night, and also tonight for calling for movement in the board to complete administrative training. An entire school year has been lost, and the more this board turns away, the deeper the problem becomes. Do not fail your teachers, do not fail the students. Put the CRE contract renewal on the agenda and vote to renew. And also, this is finals week. You have students here, and they are being so brave and staying up so late, and they deserve all the respect, and a theater, and a pool, and, and an actual English teacher. Did you, did you hear that? <laughs> Thank you. 
Good evening, and yes to everything here. I don't want to be too redundant, and thank you also to Trustee Bolanoska, who's been so supportive and came and taught four hours of a regenerative farming class to my classes. So um, I want to say yes to all of it, of course, and this is the bare minimum that a school should deserve, to finish it out, to actually finish it. It's an unfinished thing. But I want us to also consider that there's something called the IRA, the, in, the Inflation Reduction Act, billions of dollars there. We should aggressively pursue it as a district. I'm talking to finance folk. You can get 50% back on tax credits for clean energy things. I know Bolano Scow and I are very passionate about climate change, which we won't have schools or anything if we don't address that. And considering clean energy projects and the guy that just spoke, getting kids involved, work-based learning. San Jose is getting millions to have internships, to have apprenticeships, to let them shadow climate tech. All of this stuff can happen. What if we built tiny homes at our school? And that would be not an $1,800 studio, but affordable for teachers. The next six public speakers are Alex Morales, Montserrat Martinez, Veronica Vasquez, Jacqueline Rosas, Stephanie Mendoza, and I can't see the first name, but it's a middle name, Lexi Martinez, PV High School. Um, hello, my name is Alex Morales. I am a junior at PV High. It is unfair that Watsonville and High School Watsonville High and Aptos High have pools. This is a problem because learning how to swim is a life skill to learn. Yes, you could argue there are swimming classes, but a lot of them you have to pay. PV High has the lowest income of all the other high schools, meaning that these parents would have to be paying more and some of this money they don't, they don't have. Um, pools at schools can be the only way students can learn how to swim. There have been cases where students from PV High have drowned for that have drowned. For example, in April 11, 2016, a PV student was found face down on the water. He was 17 years old. If only he had a pool that taught people how to swim, maybe he could still be alive today. Thank you. My name is Montserrat Martinez. I'm a junior at Pajaro Valley High School. And I was told that by 2017, we would have a auditorium. There was even a newspaper with a picture of, of as, a, as an example for the future building. And where is it? <laughs> where is the thing that we, that we were promised? Where are the dreams of many students of Pajaro Valley? Seven years and some of those students already have graduated. And there are many out more to come if we don't change that. So why not use it for the children that want to participate in our school and be a part of those activities? I have been a part of the everyday challenges I see every time we perform, our teacher gets stressed over not having enough resources and yet we pull through. Having Mr. Robledo as a teacher that has gone beyond for his students, going out of his way to do everything, no. supporting each and every of our one dreams. No. But one. all I wonder one is minute. why can't you do the same for us? I hope that you guys can give us this and prioritize us. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Veronica Vasquez Udino. We have been asking for an auditorium for years, yet nothing has been made of it. Us students have done the best we can with what we have, but it doesn't mean we should accept the very little things that have been given to us. There are so many amazing people in our school that have not been given enough space or resources. As a student in the Florcorico and theater class, I feel uncomfortable being in a cramped space while doing so much movement. When we tried performing in our cafeteria, which gave us a bit more space than our classroom, a lot of us kept slipping because that floor was not meant to dance on the whole time. We performed, we tried to be careful 
of not falling. Same with the gym. We had to tape the bottom of our shoes, which had less of an effect, but that is all we have. We have nowhere else to perform in school. All the skirts are borrowed. If it's part of the class, why are, we, are they being borrowed? They should be able to have one by the, uh, given to the, by the school. The tiles we used for the, in the wrestling room was a challenge to remove them from the ground and take them from classroom to classroom. The weight had left red marks on me and my friends. We had a hard time carrying them. Another friend of mine had their fingers hurting because of pulling the towels out with their nails. Thank you for listening. Good evening and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jacqueline Roses and I am a Pajaro Valley High student. I am here today advocating for a theater to be built in our school. PV has so much potential among its students and faculty that a theater would allow them to showcase their talents. It would also allow PV students to host events, showcase theater productions, and provide a stronger sense of community on our campus. A theater can also host guest speakers, assemblies, and community events. It's an investment in the students, cultural education, the community, providing them with opportunities to explore history, literature, and art. Due to the lack of facilities, theater students struggle to produce plays. Adding a theater to PV is an equitable choice, ensuring that future Grizzlies have the space to showcase their talents and culture. I recently participated in Voz Ritme Cultura and was disappointed that we didn't have the opportunity to host the event in our own um, school. The students and faculty at PV would greatly appreciate if we could finally have the facilities to thrive. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Stephanie Mendoza, and I am a senior at Pajaro Valley High School. Today, I stand before you to advocate and ask for your support in the construction of a swimming pool and auditorium at Pajaro Valley High School. Learning to swim is extremely important for safety, first and foremost. It's a life skill that can prevent drowning, plus it can be used for PE classes, swim team practice, and even community events. It is indeed unfortunate that our local high schools have swimming pools while we don't. An auditorium would be amazing for drama class. It gives us a proper stage for performances, better acoustics, and lighting. It's tough having drama events in the wrestling room. It's cramped and all the equipment, equipment gets in the way. A real auditorium would give everyone the space they need to shine. I hope all of you take my speech into consideration and support a better future for Pajaro Valley High School. Thank you all for your time. Good evening, my name is Lexi and I am a student at PV and I'm here to talk about how silly I think it is to get rid of the CRE curriculum. The reason to get, to get rid of it is, to, is silly and ethnic studies is the only class to truly talk about the history of the students and not the history that you want us to learn. The students of Watsonville deserve to know their own history, the history of people like us. Thank you. The next six public speakers are Bernie Gomez, Chris Webb, Eli Gonzalez, Karina Moreno, Gabriel Medina, and Evan Jacquez Mintz. Uh, good evening, Bernie Gomez. Um, First and foremost, I uh, want to thank Dr. Holm for uh, just having courage and showing face, right, uh, at the town hall meeting that was organized by amazing parents and community members, right? Uh, thank you. You know, I think that's what having palabra is all about, you know, showing up, having that plática, you know, even if we disagree or whatever, you know, we still have to one way or another, something's gonna happen, so might as well do it in a good way, you know? Um, Dr. Contreras, mucho gusto, welcome. Um, I know that this issue was held till you, you got here. Ya estás aquí. You know, you've been hearing what's going on, and you have a, a, a big lift to help uh, the students, the community, PVUSD, to get back on track. Uh, we look forward to working with you, and hopefully this board kind of gets their act together and help us out, too. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I had wanted to share this at the safety committee meeting, but had trouble accessing the meeting. About a year ago, a former cabinet member had met me in my room at Renaissance and told me teachers had no right to see camera footage of, at the school and PVUSD was not responsible for damage to personal property while on campus. Um, I want to commend former administrator Deanna Young for always supporting staff in this respect. She, she was better than that um, message I got. PVUSD should have a policy stating that staff with reasonable suspicion of vandalism to their property while on campus may view the footage to investigate the damage to their property. Don't force teachers to have to resort to law enforcement just to um, protect their, themselves and their, their property. Um, also, this would be a good way to promote mental health. Um, also, I would like to ask that next year we have the collaboration day be on back to Wednesday. For me, it's easier to focus at the district PDs when they're on a Wednesday than on Friday. And finally, um, per one of your comments, Trustee Costa, I just wanted to read a little bit of Ed Code for you, Ed Code 35145.5. Every agenda for regular meetings shall provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly minute. address the governing board on any item of interest to the public before or during the what? governing board's consideration of the item. Thank you. Um, buenas noches. Uh, first of all, I want good evening board. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Dr. Holm um, and student Student Trustee Romero uh, Maya for attending the town hall, right? Uh, I mentioned to both of you all when you all were there that um, I, I brought up this whole concept about coming together, getting in space, and actually talking to figure out solutions for all of us, right? I think that's what I mentioned. That's what this community is trying to do, come together to find solutions. But we also need you at the table, all of you at the table, not just one, not just two, all of you all. Uh, I think I heard you right now, Trustee Dodge mentioned this is about Watsonville, this is about your constituents. This is exactly what this is about because a lot of the folks that are being impacted, and I know you know this, a lot of the folks that are under arrest, that are on probation, come from this region, come from this space. The school to prison pipeline is real. It's important that we bring back that CRE contract and put in the agenda. Um, let's have these conversations. The little ones are watching. The elders always told me, the little ones are watching. They're watching how we act here, and if we don't do this the right way, um, all this goes to waste. Thank you all. Hola, buenas noches. My name is Karina Moreno. Um, Heather, Dr. Heather, um, mucho gusto. You know, I wasn't here at your first meeting, uh, last meeting, but um, mucho gusto, you know, and thank you too to Dr. Jennifer Holm for coming out on Monday night. You know, it was, it was, I really appreciated getting to talk to you and have a conversation with you and that you took the time out of your Monday afternoon too to come and, and be curious and hear what, what it was for, what it meant for a lot of the students for, and for Dr. Allison and what it was that they're actually trying to bring back, you know? And so I do ask that you bring back the CRE contract so that we can have that conversation. Um, but to the rest of the board too, I just wanted to address like, it is so amazing that the youth come and they give public comment and I don't understand how that is not one of the coolest and your most favorite part of this job. You know, when I was in school, all I heard was that we we're so unengaged. And then I came back as a Monterey Bay Aquarium science mentor because I knew better. I was like, no, we're just under supported and, you know, um, under stimulated. And to still hear that and to see you guys not appreciate the effort that it takes for them to get here, you know, typing up their comment, learning about these things. I never heard about these things. I never made a public comment until I was like in my 20s. So, you know, thank you for coming and supporting them. And, you know, please stop with these stall tactics and, and these scare tactics, you know, like uplift their voices. Thank you. Good evening, Gabriel Medina, uh, candidate for District 3. I'm sad Soto wasn't here. I had a poem for him. But I made one for you, Georgina, Georgia. So I call this Censures and Sensibility, a trustee's tale. In this hall where we unite to shine a beam to bring the light, a trustee claim no politics here, yet her actions bring us here. Miss meetings, 26 and count, early exit. But where's the mount? Secret plans to fire in the dark. Transparency definitely leaves a mark. Emails and shadows cast. Trust is broken, fading fast. We demand a truthful stand for the future of our land. My body, brown and political too. 
right? We face resistance old and new. We stand here strong despite the fray. For justice, we won't be swayed. Focus on the students' needs and integrity in all our deeds. No more secrets, no more lies. In trust and truth, our strength lies. No more, no more will we let shadows reign. Our brown skin fights through the pain. We're here today, we make it clear, in unity we persevere. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Hello members of the board. I heard that you were encouraging students not to attend this meeting because of how close it is to finals. It's almost 10 o'clock and you chose to move item 12 before us. Like I said last time, we will keep showing up and we'll keep talking about ethnic studies and CRE until you bring it back. Despite studying and stress, despite the end of the school year, and despite the fact that I have finals tomorrow morning, I'm still here and so are all these students that were here earlier. We are here to talk to you. Will you listen to us? I would also like to say hello to Superintendent Dr. Contreras. I saw you at the Harvey Milk Day flag raising ceremony today, and I really appreciate you being there and showing up for LGBT youth. But I do want you to realize that your support cannot be performative. Um, sorry. Uh, if you truly care about 2S LGBT issues, you would support us by bringing back CRE as the two are intrinsically linked. It gave me hope to see you there today. Do not disappoint us. I urge the board to bring the topic of CRE back up to vote and approve it. Thank you. The next six public speakers are Cassandra Hernandez, Gabriel Barata, Dr. Ludres Barata, Angel Ponce, Eduardo Montesino, and Pam Sexton. Good evening, I'm Dr. Barraza, and I'm here once again to advocate for the CRE contract. I want to thank Dr. Holmes for being the only one to attend our town hall, even though everybody was invited. But unfortunately, we're not surprised. We predicted she would be the only one to attend, which is really sad. It's clear that some of the board members here do not care to learn what ethnic studies really is about, and they insist on holding on to their fake beliefs and false accusations. You were elected because people thought you were going to have the students' best interest at heart, but boy, were they wrong. Some of the trustees here have shown that they only care about themselves. They do not care anything that the students have to say. But thank you for getting the ethnic studies movement started here at PVUSD. Our movement grows each day, and this group of people are going to make sure that the trustees that ignore students, parents, teachers, and the community members are replaced by people who actually care about the students, not just themselves. And lastly, I really hope that you guys stop putting items so far down because it does, it does affect the student's mental health. You guys had a resolution for mental health. How are you living up to it if you're making students stay up until 10 o'clock at night? Live up to your resolution. Don't just write a little paper and sign your name on it. Live up to it. Good evening. My name is Gabriel Barraza from Area 5. I am here yet again to advocate for the CRE contract and for you guys to actually not just pretend to hear or listen, but to do, because listening without doing is nothing. So we are here at the end of a school year wasted by this board, though it wasn't a complete waste. We managed to start a movement aimed at replacing most of you with people who are actually listening to and caring about the community. We had a town call this week and you were all invited. The only person on the board who came was the only person who didn't need to come. So thank you again, Dr. Holm. I know that you all can't comment during this time, but the frustrating thing is that you never comment at all. You never take any position at all. Certainly your inaction sends a clear message of disdain, but it has to be inferred. Again, either you don't care or you are cowards who know you're on the wrong side and are just praying to keep the community at bay until after November. You can't. This inaction will be your legacy. One minute. Thank you for helping us to put ethnic studies into action. Um, 
Hello everyone and good evening. My name is Cassandra and I am a graduating senior at PV High. I'm here to talk about why PV needs a theater auditorium for the performing drama class. First and foremost, a theater auditorium is not just a place for performances, it is a space for creativity, collaboration, and personal growth. It allows to enhance their acting skills, experiment with different roles, and showcase their talents to a live audience. This experience is valuable for students who are passionate about drama and want to further pursue a career in the performing arts. It gives students a place to come together, support each other, and work towards a common goal. Through rehearsals and performances, students learn how to communicate effectively, problem solve creatively, and collaborate with others, skills that are essential for success both on and off the stage. So thank you. Hi, my name is Angel Ponce, and I represent the class of 2018 of PV High a class that was not offered ethnic studies. I am proud that the classes after me are being offered this important uh, discussion and curriculum, but I'm disappointed that the board is not putting its staff's training or the student's self-concept discovery or self-awareness first by not renewing the CRE contract. I attended the town hall this past Monday on what lessons are being taught in ethnic studies in the district, and none of them express anti-Semitism. I ask you to add the CRE contract to the agenda so the board, the students, and the community can have an open and honest discussion of concerns of anti-Semitism in the field's curriculum. I'll leave you with an annotated version of the framework I received at the town hall for your critical reflection. And hello and welcome, Dr. Contreras. We met briefly at Starlight at the Garden. Hi, my name is Pam Sexton and I'm here as a teacher and as a parent and also as a member of SURGE. Um, S-U-R-J stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice, um, Santa Cruz County Chapter. And we're part of a national organization and our local chapter is 100% behind the demand, the ask to please bring back the CRE contract. Our, it was mentioned earlier um, by many people, the, the town hall, and this I, collective liberation is what community responsive education is about, and, and it's what we need. Um, please, in solidarity with students, with, with all of the ethnic studies teachers, please um, make this action now. Eduardo Montesino, are you here? Okay. So the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The next six are Jessica Gonzalez, Marilyn Garrett, Desi Salinas Holtz, Jen Salinas Holtz, Carlos Suel Gonzalez, and Jose Alcaraz. Alcoraz. Hello, my name is Jessica Gonzalez. I'm a senior from Watsonville High School, and I just wanted to say bring back CRE. We want to continue with our education about ethnic studies. It's really important to us. We've been coming since, a, since September. We had um, the Ethnic Studies Town Hall on Monday and invited all of you, seeing how no one showed up except Dr. Holmes says a lot. We just hear words, but no action. Seeing how you were delaying the public comment shows how little you really care about students' voice, and you're supposed to listen to us and then make good choices for the students' education. Schools are lacking resources, but you guys aren't doing anything about it. You guys get health insurance, not just for you, but your family and power. Do, you, do your work and bring back CRE. Before I start, I want to make a note publicly that I have been observing Chair Acosta and Kim DeSerpa 
not looking at the speakers as they speak, but rather at their computers. Now you can start it. Go back. Is this one of the books you're banning? A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn that is part of the Ethnic Studies curriculum. It starts out, Columbus, the Indians, and Human Progress. Arawak men and women, naked, tawny, and full of wonder, emerged from their villages onto the island's beaches and swam out to get a closer look at the strange big boat. When Columbus and his sailors came ashore, carrying swords, speaking oddly, the Arawaks ran to greet them, brought them food, water, gifts. He later wrote of this in his one, log. One minute, Marilyn. One minute. Tells of what they exchanged and the, how they didn't know about arms and were cut by their swords. And then he said, Let's with 50 men, we could subjugate them all Let's and make them do whatever we want. People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Good evening, Dr. Contreras and trustees. My name is Jen Salinas-Holtz. I'm a PVUSD parent and staff person and a member of the PVUSD LGBTQ Task Force and a Watsonal resident of trustee area too. Today is Harvey Milk Day. We had a beautiful pride flag raising event this morning at the district office, which was attended by fourth through 12th grade students from six PVUSD schools. And the students presented the resolution that this board approved two weeks ago. Dr. Contreras uh, was there with us, and as you've heard from students, they noticed that. So I hope you'll all join us at next year's event. We do this every year, and it means a lot to LGBTQ plus and ally students to see support. I also want to thank Dr. Holm for attending the Ethnic Studies Community Town Hall meeting, and um, I hope that she will be able to share with you all what she learned. There was a lot of important information presented. Um, I know my time is up, so please bring back the CRE contract. This is important. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board and superintendent Contre Contreras. Sorry, uh, my name is Desi Salinas Holtz, and I'm a sophomore at Watsonville High School. Uh, I'm gonna say some really similar stuff to what my mom said, but uh, I first want to start off by just commenting about the Harvey Milk uh, Harvey Milk Day flag raising event earlier. It's always beautiful to see our community come together for this event every year. And I especially want to thank Dr. Contre Contreras, my bad again, uh, for coming out to show her support today. Um, now that I got that out of the way, uh, I'm once again would like to share my concern about not renewing the CRE contract. A every meeting, uh, us students come out here and just ask for our voices to be heard. And there's some amazing individuals that have been out here too, just speaking up and speaking their hearts out. Um, there's not much more to say that's already been said. And also, while I'm up here, I, the, uh, I go to Watsonville High School, but the students at PV High School were saying some really good stuff too. And it, they also, same thing, they need to be heard. And we're just going to keep coming back. But thank you guys. So have a good evening. Hi, uh, my name is Jose Alcaraz, and I am a PV High School, uh, 12th grade. And I want to talk about uh, theater for PV. Um, I'm a, an actor that has been going around with other schools as well to perform because PV doesn't have a theater to even perform. So it's sad to know that, you know, in PV, I have to, like, help Robledo just to, like, make the stage and make sure he's not too stressed out because, you know, we don't have a stage and, and we're always falling, we're always getting hurt. And then Watsonville and other schools, they have a theater. You know, that, that's, not, that's not okay. You know, PV also deserves one. So, I mean, maybe just, I don't know, PV cares, show that you care. You know, you guys are here and you guys are, you know, acting like, you know, you guys care about what we're talking about. Maybe do something about it, you know? Anyways, that's it.
As you heard earlier, my name is Carlos Huel Gonzalez. I'll be reading from my skipped, not looking at y'all nor taking off my hat, as I see no reason in giving you some of some of you the respect that you do not show to us except Dr. Contreras and Holm. I'm happy to be here tonight to give a public comment and study for finals at the same time. So to comment, I'd like to specifically mention how impactful the Harvey Milk event at the district office was today, where they'd raised the progress flag, which recognizes and includes the black and indigenous queer community. A lovely notion, as I know some on the board are not too keen on recognizing those communities among others. And I asked, should we put those in power who don't stand for the community they're supposed to elevate and represent? I'll say a brief, it's great to see that awareness within the district as the importance of recognizing us in history has been diminished more recently with those who oppose renewing the CRE contract. Remember, your actions affect the future generation and their education. I shouldn't have to say this as a 16 year old who is the affected party. Nevertheless, I know this weighs on your conscience. I am not a nagging voice, I am a person. Make the right choice. And Georgia Acosta, you turn your gaze while we speak, so I hope when you sleep tonight you dream of my words. Then you'll listen, and just maybe it'll help you incorporate who you're supposed to elevate into our education. Thank you. The, the last two speakers I have right here are Kevin Norton and Ryan Olivas. Those are the only ones I have for 9.1. You guys lost it. Shouldn't be her miss out there. Because she was right before we were. Well, we're going to we put that card in because it is in that whole stack. And that yeah. has been sitting here for hours. So that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kevin Norton. Uh, I have a background in public health and I'm here to talk about a soda tax, which may help with building theaters in schools and is a real possibility um, this year. I'm worried about the effects that soda and other sweetened beverages are having on the health of children <clears throat> and adults. I've worked at a hospital I've, and have seen all of the preventable suffering that uh, our food system causes. <clears throat> Did you know that half of American Latinos now end up getting type 2 diabetes? Uh, I need assurance from all of you that we will protect our children from the epidemic of preventable diseases linked to soda, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, cavities, cancer, and much more. <clears throat> A soda tax would not only protect our health, but we can use the money on health education and invest in parks, sports programs, new bicycle and walking paths, the schools, and so on. Let's pass a soda tax this year. Don't wait. We need to act fast to get this on the ballot for November. Please contact your city council members this week to schedule a meeting and tell them why you want a soda tax to prevent our uh, to protect women. our children and invest women. in our community. And after the soda tax, we can pass a tax on harmful pesticides. Uh, thank you and take good care. Ryan Olivas. Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, Nat Lowe. Hi, good evening, board. Um, Trustee Holm, thank you for coming out to our community town hall on Monday. Um, we appreciate you showing up to listen and learn with us. Um, as for the rest of you, during the Q&A session at the town hall, one of the students asked, where is the rest of the board? Don't they know that this is important to us? Dr. Tintiango Cubales came all the way from San Francisco to, talk, to speak with our community and engage with the students and to share her stories about ethnic studies and hear theirs and to answer questions. Some of you can't even be bothered to go across town to visit an ethnic studies classroom to listen to your students and teachers. But you know who else came? The candidates who are going to replace Trustee Sacosta and Soto in November. If you want us to vote for the, board, the bond measure, you need to show us that we can trust you to listen to the community and have the students' best interests at heart. If you can't do that with a $110,000 contract that the community wants and that you already have the grant funding for, how can we trust you with $315 million? Show us that you can be accountable to us and then we will be happy to vote for the bond measure. Thank you. Thank you very much, and President Acosta, that is it for public comment. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. The board will take a three minute recess at this time.
Like, Hello. Please. Like, <laughs> 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 it's I was in San Francisco at I'm going to call the meeting back to order, um, and I'd like to call for a point of order and see if I can ask from a board member if they would like to extend the meeting, given that we have um, 11 minutes left. And when you consider a motion to extend the meeting, I'd like you to recognize that we have one public hearing, nine action items, and three report and discussion items to get through. I move to extend the meeting till 1 a.m. I have a motion to extend the meeting till 1 a.m. Do I have a second? Second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? The board meeting is now extended to 1 a.m. and that carries on a 601 vote. Now we will move to um, item 10, our employee organization comments. This is the time that we hear from our employee organizations and each will have five minutes. And we will start with 10.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have anyone here from PVFT that would wish to speak? Me. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, board. Um, President Acosta and Dr. Contreras. Uh, I just want to first just commend our students who are here um, today. You know, students at PV High School are definitely persevering in the face of adversity, and that's pretty rad. Um, so this week we honor our classified brothers and sisters in the CSEA um, and we appreciate the incredible support they provide in ensuring that our classes can happen. Um, it is, you know, classified employee week, appreciation week. Our state federation um, held a rally at the, ca at the state capitol yesterday with the theme that there is no class without classified. And so we thank our CSEA brothers and sisters because that is very true. Um, this board meeting marks the last one held during the student calendar year. And um, this new format, this adjustment in it, um, which places the public com comment where it places it, is, um, is a challenge. And I know that it's, I looked at Modesto City Schools and I know that that's where the format came because that's when the first time I saw the, the new format, I was like, hmm, I'm gonna see what Modesto City Schools did. Uh, but I really do want you to take into consideration that Modesto City School started their board meetings at five, and um, therefore public comment was not at an unreasonable time. And you know this is this is a burden on our students, and our students should not be silenced in advocating for this for the schools that they deserve. Um, so, on on and just in in the in the same theme of of adjustments. Well, something that ha that used to happen here is um, our board meetings were translated to Spanish, and that's what was up on um, the district's YouTube page, so our Spanish-speaking families could see the board meeting in Spanish, and that was discontinued several years ago, and that is a big issue, and it should um, come back because it completely uh, denied the... Um, the empowerment of our uh, Spanish-speaking community. So um, I want to uh, commend uh, Jenny M's uh, presentation today on the on the bond and what I want to, and, and I really liked what she said with, um, I know she, there was other people involved, but um, I liked what she said, you know, we, you wanna, we wanna build comfortable, safe environments. And we're totally down with that. That's what the PBFT is all about. That's actually what, uh, a lot of teachers unions are all about making sure that we have um, comfortable, safe environments. Our district recently won $32 million for community schools. This bond could also be helpful in helping um, con you know, drive that um, thought process on how are we going to be you know, implementing community schools and how is this bond money going to benefit that. And so what that means is y'all need to talk to us. So. PBFT, we like to ensure that we go to safe, clean environments as well, and we have people power. So if 
this is a, a, a piece of, of an important uh, item for the district, and we're part. We're an important piece of that district, along with CSEA and C um, and CWA, with all the people that are involved in lifting our our district up. And so we hope that you do collaborate with us because we all are stakeholders. Um, and now I will get into some of the the what I'm frustrated about. Um, I'm frustrated, and Brian Saxton has heard me on a daily basis uh, kind of go on my frustrated rants. Um, but they're not rants, really. I am sincerely frustrated that there is a continued lack of respect for our members and our um, the language, just a lack of respect for labor agreements. And it's, it's this continued uh, bad practice that, has, that was enabled and fostered and enabled and encouraged in previous administration leaderships. And it's not okay because the people power is important. Classified, you have no class without classified. And you're, you heard your students, they are also your constituents. They don't have teachers who are fully credentialed or credentialed to help navigate and get, you know, through their journey, you know, guide them through their journey of learning biology, AP calculus, whatever it may be, these, these high level classes that we need for our high school students. And so they are not receiving the education that they deserve. So what I'm frustrated with specifically is our SELPA department. I can file some ULPs today, tomorrow, when they open. We have learned of the SELPA making changes in working conditions without coming to us first. We have um, had to remind them that, hey, we, re we sent you an info request, and that was like a month and a half ago. Info requests that would help us understand the decisions that they're making before they're made. And so I show up to a meeting to represent members without that information having been given to me. And also, bypassing and direct dealing with our members. Big no-no. There's a lot to be done. You heard me say that the night that Dr. Contreras um, was hired. And uh, I said, she's got a lot. There's a lot. And there still is a lot. And it's a, it's, I know it's a, something that you, you're, you realized when you came in. That's when you finally realized how, how big this 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 uh, challenges. And as our students said, actions do speak louder than words. So we're listening, but we also want to see some actions. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. California School Employees Association, do we have anyone here from CSCA? Seeing none, Communication Workers of America, our Substitutes Teachers Union, CWA, welcome. How are you doing? My name is David Romo, born and raised in Watsonville, California. My dad lives in Mexico. He lives in Jalisco, Jalisco. So I have actually a dual citizen of both Mexico and the United States. So 20 years ago, I helped found a union uh, to basically get a little bit more money. At that point, we were making like $79 a day. And we're, we're actually really happy. We just recently negotiated. We, we just closed our other contract. We have, we, we got a really nice deal, but you know, we, we still not satisfied. Like most people in this community in this here earlier are not satisfied. Um, we're very satisfied and we'll be even more satisfied once we get an increase for long-term teachers. I was talking to one teacher today and he had a concern. He just retired. Hey David, I'm in a situation where I'm making a 240 a day, a day doing a long term. And I'm responsible for the, the lesson plans, the report cards, the CUMES. I don't have time. I'm not gonna get paid for it. Well, now you know where we are as long term, as long -term substitutes. Some of us, we started as long term substitutes. And yeah, we're, we, do, we do the work that you don't get appreciated for, you don't get, you don't get paid for. So we're hoping to get that rate up 
so he can be compensated, maybe at least a couple of hours, maybe a day's pay to do his cumes, because now he's realized he's off the team. He's not on Nelly's team anymore, he's on our team. And most people in this world are on our team. They're, down, they're basically downtrodden, they're stepped on, and all this has to stop. We, we were making the same, as LPAC testers, Mike is gonna speak on this, we were making 30, 30, well, $36 an hour, all LPAC testers were making that. Now that, now the rates have separated, you have retired teachers getting 42, we're getting 35, we're making less. Structurally, we need to fix this, just like you need to fix all your schools, but the simple, the solutions are very simple. We're not talking about millions of dollars, we're talking about seven or eight dollars an hour. Thank you, David. Yeah, Mike Floor here. Um, good evening, board. Dr. Contreras and President Acosta. David's mentioning the LPAC testing rate. It's really fresh in my soul right now because I've been working diligently since February 1st to get the 95% completion rate done. And I'm tasked with the high schools and two virtual high schools. So our coordinator gave me the responsibility because I asked, can I call the houses and schedule the remote schools, all of them? Let me take it off those interim principal's shoulders. I was working since 7.30 this morning doing that. We had our LPAC testing party today at the Castro Adobe House. I went to it briefly, and then I came here. So I haven't even been home yet. I've been going since 7.30 this morning. Got to wait till almost 11 o'clock to do with our negotiation. So with regards to the negotiation, and I have a co public comment card for 11.1 .1 in case I need those couple minutes if I don't finish this in time. So I'll turn that in if I need to. It's in my pocket, it's my little gun. Basically, LPAC testing rates have become unfair. There would be no LPAC testing team right now if it wasn't for me and David. David was the only returning person from the original team when COVID happened. We got recruited, substitutes got recruited to fill the gap and David is the one that trained all of us and then I've taken it further and there's a team of testers now because me and David trained them. So there wouldn't be any completion rate if it wasn't for us and we're making the least amount of money of anybody there. So I've been trying to find out the testing rate at neighboring districts I was calling HR departments, and it's a busy time of the year, so I didn't get an answer. So I reached out to the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. I talked to Marsha Russell. She is the Senior Director of District um, Support. She's filling in for Sophia Sorensen, who's left her position. They haven't hired anybody to fill her position yet. So she's the one that's kind of doing that. And she told me that the districts negotiate their own tester rate within the district. So that is what we're gonna be doing through the CWA union. And then I'll finish this up with my public comment. Let me turn it in right now. Thank you very much. Can I turn this in? Thank you, David and Mike. Thank you. Uh, and we also, you can also come back on 12.2 too. Um, do we have anyone from Pabam? Welcome. Good evening, Board President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, Board Trustees and Cabinet. I'm Peggy Pugh, Executive Director for Teaching and Learning for PBUSD, and I'm proud to be here tonight to, uh, on, on behalf of my Pajaro Valley Association of Management uh, colleagues. So today, you heard a little bit about this earlier today, students, staff, and community members and PBUSD administrators celebrated Harvey Milk Day with the raising of the progress flag at our district office. Harvey Milk Day is a celebration of visibility and acceptance. We honor Harvey Milk to help our students thrive while we commit to the continuous work it takes to ensure students feel safe every day to be themselves and to be seen. Thank you to our PVUSD LGBTQ plus task force and our student services coordinator, Chrissy McLean, for leading the effort. 
When students are truly seen for who they are and celebrated for celebrating others, they become leaders. We saw powerful student leadership today. We had fourth through 12th grade students and staff from Alianza, Lakeview, Pajaro Middle, Aptos High, pa Pajaro Valley High, Watsonville High, and our own school district office. Student speakers inspired us with their joy and bravery. One student in particular noted the significance of raising the progress flag, includes the brown and black stripes that honored the indigenous Latinx parts of himself and the community of Watsonville. We participated in a beautiful community sing-along led by Ms. Jessalyn Levine, our Aptos High and Aptos Junior High choir teacher. We were grateful to have Dr. Contreras join us and note that she's already looking forward to how this event can grow even more over the years. Students read details about Harvey Milk and parts of the resolution that was approved at our last meeting. The amazing service we were able to provide as administrators through the collaboration between multiple district departments and school site leaders was affirmed in unity of purpose and unity of experience today. Thank you also to our transportation department for prioritizing providing a bus for our students. During this classified appreciation week and the month of May, the, the month in which we celebrate our certificated staff, to see so many of our classified and certificated employees supporting the event through their work and their presence was inspiring. As PAVAM members, we're grateful for our partnership with our CSEA and PVFT partners. And finally, as students raised the progress flag, the crowd of around 80 PVUSD community members sang, some of us better than others, Cindy Lauper's True Colors. It was beautiful, like a rainbow. Today's event was short and sweet, but the impact was powerful. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 11.1, .1, the public hearing for um, Communication Workers of America Local 9423 for the initial sunshine proposal to PVSD for reopener for negotiations for the 2023 through 2025 school years. And this report will be presented by the Director of Human Resources, Mr. Brian Sexton. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, members of the board. Uh, my name is Brian Sachs. I'm the Director of Human Resources for Certificated Staff, and I'm pleased to present to you tonight uh, the public hearing for our Sunshine Proposal, or not ours, but the Communication Workers of America Sunshine Proposal to PVUSD. Uh, you can see it on the, oh good, you blew it up on the screen. I was. You can see that they are bringing up wage-related matters and a listing there, and then also payroll reporting and lists. So um, this is a public hearing. This is not the action item that will come later. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have two, Marilyn Garrett and Mike Floor. Agenda item 11.1. Workers are the foundation of everything that takes place in our society. And unions protect workers and their rights and their health. So um, communication workers, I'll tell you what, I'm for um, safe communication tools, all this wireless microwave, Technology is hazardous, and uh, you can check out bioinitiative.org or cellphonetaskforce.org. Um, and I just want to say I was in Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers the 20 years I taught in this district at MSD and Calabasas schools. So, um, Yes, to the unions and their well-being. Thank you. Hello again, board, to pick up where I left off before. So Marsha Russell told me today that each individual district, the 10 neighboring districts, they negotiate their own LPAC tester rate. And we want to do it during the CWA union time because David and I are both paying union members as substitutes. We have a job duty 
a job role as LPAC testers, but we are substitutes. So if I want to get formal about that, we're talking about job duties related to job descriptions. And we are both union paying members. So if we walk onto a campus to do LPAC testing, do we lose our union um, benefits, or benefits that day? It's a state required test and it's a very important role. So that's why we want to talk about this during CWA's time. We want a fair rate, not a pay reduction. Those other pay rates are all pretty standard and straightforward. The LPAC testing is the one that's a bit contingent. So that's just what I wanted to finish. Thank you. Thank you both. And that was the last of our public speakers. Yes, that was it. Now I bring it back to the board for questions, comments, deliberation, discussion. Trustee bologna -Scow. Well, I just want to give a thanks to CWA and to Mr. Sachs. And it is exciting that uh, we have an opportunity to address these things finally. So I just want to thank you for, for being here, your comments, your work, your service is important to our district. So I'm, I'm looking forward to tackling it um, and have a lot of faith in our administration to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee bologna -Scow. Anyone else? All right, um, I'm just going to make a, a brief comment. I um, had the pleasure earlier today of speaking with Nancy Biagini um, and also receiving an email from her um, and as well as Mr. Floor. Um, unfortunately, she could not be here, right? She, she is their assistant to the temporary administrator for CWA Local 9423. And, had, and she's a planning commissioner for the city of Santa Clara and had a meeting conflict and couldn't be here and really regretted that she couldn't be here. And I assured her that I was going to read that into the public record that she wanted to be here um, and couldn't. So um, due to meeting conflicts, and that happens, right, when we're serving our communities. So thank you to you both for being here and um, to Nancy for reaching out and you too, Mr. Floor. We will now move from item 11.1 to item 12.2, the Communication Workers of America Local 9423, the initial sunshine proposal, to PVUSD for reopener negotiations for the 2023-2025 school year. And this report will be presented by our Director of Human Resources, Mr. Brian Saxton. Good evening again, President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, and members of the board. I'm Brian Saxon, a Human Resources Director. So this is the action item related to our public hearing. And I just want to clarify, um, this is for our substitute teachers. They are represented by the Communication Workers of America, but that's an organization that represents companies such as AT&T and Verizon, but they also represent our substitute teachers. Um, and just along the lines of this action item, there's nothing new in it um, from the public hearing, but um, we do really value our substitutes. We appreciate them. We know that they show up every day to take on the classes that where the teacher's not there. And without them, we have uncovered classes if they can't be there. Um, and so we appreciate what they do. We do look forward to working through our negotiations with them. It was uh, last time it went very well. So we look forward to just doing that again. So with that, we uh, kindly request your approval. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. OK, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion, deliberation. Trustee bolano -Scow. Yeah, thank you for this. I just want to thank our, our substitute teachers. We sometimes have a shortage of bilingual subs at some of our schools. We've had a new uh, bilingual sub at Amesti. Been super, super valuable. We want subs to come from all over the county and region to work at PVUSD. We are a big district. I think we're the biggest district in the Monterey Bay region still. We're pretty close. So it's important we get this right. And I'll make a motion to approve it if that's what you need. Thank you, Trustee bolano -Scow. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa. I believe we are the highest paid sub rate in the county, correct? Um, I think we're pretty close. There may be a couple other of the smaller districts that pay more, but yes, we are I think very Santa Cruz, competitive. Yeah, I think Santa Cruz might have just ratified some type of a contract, but I'm not sure what the details of that are yet. But um, I feel very, thank you um, to CWA for coming forward. I sat at this 
on this dais for many years where we'd call for you and nobody ever showed up. And so we're really glad that you're here and able to negotiate on behalf of our subs in the district. We do want the best for our kids. And so paying the highest salary is really important. So um, with that, I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Any other questions, comments, or deliberation? All right, I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. We look forward to negotiations with you all. Thank you. Um, moving on to item 12.4, the memorandum of understanding between PVUFT and PVUSD for the department chairs at comprehensive secondary sites. And this report will be presented again by Director of Human Resources, Mr. Brian Saxton. Good evening again, President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, and members of the board. I'm Brian Saxton, Director of Human Resources. And so this is a memorandum between PVFT and PVUSD regarding department chairs. Um, it, it kind of clarifies some of their um, work, how long they meetings can last after school, right? If there are some expectations beyond that, um, how they will be paid, and um, some of the duties that department chairs handle. Department chairs are an essential part of our secondary schools. They help run our departments, mm -hmm. English, language, arts, social studies, um, all of those. And so they meet with the principal on a monthly basis, and they also have other responsibilities for their department. So this is a, a, a wonderful MOU between us, and so we kindly request your approval. Oops, thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. 12.4 is Chris Webb. <clears throat> uh, I'm generally pleased with this. And um, I, th my main question is, um, or concern is that I, I'm, I'm worried that this won't apply to the department chairs at Renaissance. And um, Post-distance learning department chairs have not been compensated with stipends as other secondary department chairs are. Um, part of the rationale for that inequity has been that the attendant meetings for a Renaissance department chairs occur during contract hours. The problem is that department chairs are taking time out of their prep for additional work and they're, they're losing that prep period compared to the other teachers at the site and that's a, an inequity. Um, and to address that, I know so, sometimes the practice is to have rotating members within a department attend the relevant meetings, but that's problematic because it undermines the integrity of those leadership meetings and the office of department chair. Um, so if item three on this MOU was to apply to Renaissance staff and department chairs there, I feel like we would have no issue and everything would be in order. If not, um, I feel that that should be modified to recognize the work that department chairs do, even at uh, alt ed sites. Thank you. That was our only public speaker, correct? Yes. Okay, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion, deliberation. Trustee Bolano Scow. <clears throat> Uh, I want to thank our administration and our union for working on this. I know this was an issue of tension in the past, and um, thank you, Mr. Webb, for your continued advocacy for Renaissance as well, and uh, always room for improvement, but I want to make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee Bolano scow Trustee DeSerpa? I'll second. I have a first and a second. Are there any other questions, comments, deliberation from the board? All right, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601, thank you. Um, next, item 12.5, approve the certificated job description for the literacy coach. Uh, this report will be presented by our Director of Human Resources, Mr. Brian Sexton. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, Board of Trustees. It's Brian Sexton, Director of Human Resources again. So this is a uh, job description put together by um, Rich Moran, myself, and the union to um, meet the needs of our new literacy coaches that are coming through from the LCRSET grant. 
which I can even tell you what that stands for. Literacy Coach and Reading Specialist Educator Training Grant. So um, this is similar to literacy coaches we have now. It's just an extension or it's a new grant. So we work together to develop a job description. Um, and so we ask for your approval on that as um, we're looking to start to hire these, these uh, employees and get them out to our school sites for next year. So we kindly request your approval. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. All right. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, deliberation. I'll move to approve. I have a motion to approve. Second. And I have a second. Is there any other questions, comments, or deliberation? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That will carry, uh, any abstaining, I'm sorry. That will carry 601. Thank you. Item 12.6, Memorandum of Understanding between PVFT and PVUSD Compensation for Covering Physical Education and Special Services. This report will be presented by the Director of Human Resources, Mr. Brian Saxton. Good evening once again, and for the last time for me tonight, so President Acosta, Superintendent Contreras, and Board of Trustees, this is an MOU that we discussed at our last board meeting for compensation for PE teachers and special education teachers who take on entire classes when their colleague may be absent or out for a, a period. So um, we did go through this last time, so I won't go through it again, but we do uh, appreciate your approval tonight for this MOU. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Or I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Approve. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any other further deliberation? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you, Mr. Saxon, for being Thank with you us very this much. evening. Um, now I'm going to move to item 12.7. Our letters, this report will be presented by whom? It will actually be prepared or um, delivered by um, Dr. Elizabeth de Vargas Almeida um, on behalf of our um, Ed Services Department. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't have that in my backup. I just had a different name. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, President Acosta, board members, and Dr. Contreras. My name is Dr. Liz de Vargas Almeida, and I am your early literacy coordinator here at PVUSD. I have this little uh, agenda item called letters, and I'm looking for your help and your support with this. We have letters as a professional development for our grant sites that Mr. Saxton just spoke about. We have eight sites entering the grant, and our literacy coaches. Can I get the slide on the next page? Can I? Aha. Gracias. Maybe. Ah, thank you. We have eight sites entering this grant, and our coaches and our site administrators do not have the same background. We're not providing professional development to our administrators and our coaches as we are for our teachers. Our teachers have ongoing professional development in literacy and English language development. We have strong curricular materials, but now we need to amp that up and prepare our administrators to really take that lift on. Here's our problem right here. 20% of our students about are the only ones able to pass our annual English language arts assessment. This is the annual state assessment that we take. That means 80% of our students are unable to pass this test. This is third grade, and it's about the same at all of our levels. That occurs because less than 50% of our students know how to read proficiently. So we need to fix that. In order for us to fix that, we have to know what the issues are. Our state superintendent, Tony Thurman, has a lofty goal for us to reach. All of our third grade students should be proficient by 2026. That's a big push. In order to do that, not only do our teachers need that professional development, but our administrators need to lead us in that direction. In order to lead us in that direction, they have to have a background. So I'm asking for your support and your help to get our administrators up to speed on their knowledge so that they know how to build that infrastructure that those eight grant sites as well as district support 
and we need our coaches to be able to support our teachers in making those best routines and best practices for our students. So our coaches help the teachers, teachers build the students, and the outreach to the families, so everybody knows what's going on. Letters is a two-year hybrid program. That means for two years, I'm asking administrators and coaches and site-level support to get involved, to learn about reading, to learn about writing, and to learn about the infrastructure needed um, to help our students out and making the best choices for our students. We have a diverse population. Our needs are always changing, and I need administrators to understand how and when to do that. I think letters is the best piece, and this is why. Um, for 12 administrators, that's the eight principals, and some district support staff, they learn about how to create the infrastructure, also the science behind reading and writing and building the, those best components for our teachers and students. That's one track. Another track is for the 22 participants, being the ACs, the academic coordinators, and the site coaches and district coaches to help with that lift. They get a deeper dive into reading and writing. It's a two-year commitment online, as well as eight professional development pieces in person. Um, they fly out to us for the cost of $111,556. It is a it's a chunk of money, I understand, but I believe it'll have the largest impact. I appreciate your time. I hope you allow us to use letters. All 50 states use it, including the state of California. We've seen the state of Mississippi grow from being the 49th in the country to, I'm sorry, let me make sure I'm telling you the actual correct number. Mississippi has gone from 49th to 21st ranking in the nation. Uh, Tennessee has gone from 42nd to 36, in part from their letters training. So if we can get a hold of that, then we can make some shifts also. We need to get our children reading and doing what's best for our community is helping our administrators understand how to do that. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. No, we don't. All right. See, now I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Trustee Milano Scow, and then Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, to what extent is uh, this based in phonics? Because I know there's been a lot of science about reading. We used to teach phonics right. successfully, and then we had a bunch of other consultants. All sorts of sell stuff. us a bunch of other things that didn't work, and now we're realizing phonics works. And I, <laughs> and I learned to read in Spanish and English at the same time because my parents read to me, and I learned the phonics in both. And I know we have a lot of bilingual kids. Mm -hmm. So how are, is this being rolled out when we have different bilingual programs at different elementary schools, and how is that working? So this is a professional development to help us learn because we have strong curricular pieces already there. We have strong assessments there but we don't always understand what to do with those pieces. So this is building the background, so we have the knowledge to make those strong choices. It is in phonics. Phonics is one part of literacy instruction. There are several parts, and we need to understand how they all work together. If you don't understand all parts, you're probably not gonna make the best judgment. So this is going to help us learn all the pieces. Phonics, but not just phonics. There's semantics, there's phonological awareness, there's taking this to comprehension, there's oral and written fluency. They all build on each other, and knowing multiple language helps to that situation. This is not a language-based program, it's a reading-based program. We have several languages in our district. We have English, we have Spanish, but we have several others, and this is going to help all of our students and all of our educators. So will it apply to the Spanish curriculum, Spanish learning as well as the English, or is it just English? It applies to all al alphabetic languages. That good, Trustee Dodge Jr. So, is this going to all elementaries, or where is this going to? This is just going to the eight grant sites. And these eight grant sites are? The eight grant sites include Calabasas, Radcliffe, Amesti, Minty White, 
landmark. I have two more. I have two more. They're coming to my brain. Ohlone. Thank you, Mr. Moran. And Starlight. Thank you, Mr. Moran. And so after these two years, what happens next? What happens next? Well, what I'm hoping is we'll see that shift in mindset, that shift in growth. I have taken letters out to another district before, and I have given it to 103 administrators and teachers, and I saw a shift quite early on, impact of teachers and students. So when people started seeing that shift, that growth, and that excitement, then others started asking for it. And at that point, hopefully, we could expand it to other sites. It's all depending. So you're using PVSD to try for two years and then go somewhere else? or do you No, no, no. I'm sorry. Um, it's only a two-year-long program. The professional yeah. development is only two years. In that two years, you should be able to gain quite a bit of knowledge and make um, steps and progress within the two years. So you should see shifts through those two years. And then we can apply those learnings throughout those two years to our other schools. We don't have to wait. When we learn something great and it's working, we share. To other schools in PVOSD? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Trustee Dodger, I think um, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Monjeres would like to jump in and add something. So one of the um, pieces in terms of the what's next um, if you go back to the slide as to who's getting trained, um, you'll see that there's district folks in there, directors and coordinators who are getting trained. The idea is that we want to be able to expand this to all of our sites, but we're taking advantage of the fact that we have the grant funds to pay for the training for um, particularly for the, the staff, at the administrative staff at those sites, plus our district folks. Once our district folks, that's basically trainers of trainers, basically, train, train them to become trainers so that we can build that sustainability within the district and train the other sites without having to pay that ginormous $111,000. Well, I'm just asking because I hear two years and then, you know, I'm not hearing where, well, you guys, it's, we'll hand it off to you guys. All I'm hearing is two years, we're looking at data, and then that's it. I'm not hearing, well, we'll hand it off to the PVOSD, and then you guys take it away from here. I'm not. No, so they're, what they're doing, what we're paying for is for them to train us okay. so that we can then move it forward in the district. Okay. That's, that's what we're paying for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee DeSerpa. Um, <clears throat> so sorry, I bet I need some clarification. So we had been using SIPs. How is this different than SIPs? So here's what I want to say is that it took a lot to move all of our schools in the right, in, in one direction so that all kids were sort of getting um, a program or a curriculum that made sense. And I, from what I understand from multiple reports, we made a lot of progress. Um, with our kids in reading and literacy. And so why this program and why now? That is a great question. Thank you for asking that. We are not changing SIPs. Okay. We are not changing any of our curriculum or assessments. That's our strong part. Our continued professional learning for our teachers in literacy and English language development is our strong part. We have that. Okay. What we have is our leaders lacking that knowledge. So we need to build it up so that everybody is speaking that same literacy language and making those strong decisions for our students. Our populations are always changing. Our needs are always changing. We need to be able to change to match their needs. Um, this is just professional learning. Okay. We're not getting rid of SIPs. Great. Um, so I saw the statistic about 50% of our students are not fluent readers by the time they're in third grade. And just if just for the board to hear again, it's really important that our kids are reading by the third grade. If they cannot read by the third grade, their outcomes later are not good in high school, junior high and high school, because they can't keep up. So it sounds like, but okay, so here's the question though. Mississippi is a completely different place sure. than 
California. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got English language learners. So is this program that's designed to assist in reading evidence-based for kids that are second language learners? It's evidence-based for educators. It helps all students who are learning to read and write because our brains work the same way no matter which languages we speak. So it helps us make better choices to include not only different languages, but different dialects so Great. that we are aware. Okay, and so we got a grant, so that's congratulations. How much was the grant for, like the total? Thanks, Rich. Um, so there are eight grant sites, and basically um, we didn't apply. Um, we were awarded the grant, <laughs> and it was based on unduplicated, so the percentage of unduplicated students. So you know, sometimes you get a grant, and you're not pleased about why you received the grant. Um, this is just based on the nature of our demographics, but we want to capitalize on it to make sure that we can use this funding to support our students, and again, start with these grant sites and then grow it out. Um, so, no school shall receive less than $450,000 per eligible site. Super helpful. So, Fantastic. So, the $111,000, is, it's like the school's match in order, or we just need to provide that to make it all work? or It's a component. I think it's a vital component to helping us kind of not only grow our programs, but again, give our educators, our leaders, the opportunity to understand the moves to make, how to use the strong programs that we have, how to use the instruction we have. Um, and the funding is different per school, but that's the minimum funding. Great. Okay. I, I'm supporting this. Congratulations. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Superintendent Dr. Contreras, did you want to add anything? I was just going to add a little bit of clarity. I'm very familiar with letters, and it basically what it teaches is the science of how a brain learns to read. And teachers and administrators who participate in that training, it is a very intense two-year training, but they leave with knowledge that will never go away and that can be used to support um, other teachers in the science of reading and how reading is acquired. And I have seen it transform uh, teachers in their classroom, even within a very short amount of time of receiving the training. So it is a good use of this um, grant dollars and a great focus for our school that I think will have a big impact on our reading scores for students. I, I want to add one piece. I'm sorry. It's not just for literacy during a literacy time or during SIPS time, but this knowledge applies to literacy throughout our day, through our core subjects, math, science, social studies, all the time, all the time, all the time. Perfect. Any other comments or questions from the board? So can we go back to the slide that I think it was the cost slide and it showed who was getting trained, I think. There's right. So when I'm looking at that, as one had as to what you were speaking to, the, the 12 administrators, the grant sites, the assistant soup, you, the ELA director, the MLL coordinator, early literacy coordinator. Um, so those four additional administrators, including, I take it, the eight schools, the principals of the those principals schools? That, mm -hmm. And so to what you were saying, I think you were saying this is training the trainer. So the, the admin is being trained before the teachers. Is that, am I to understand that that's what this part of the start of this process is <clears throat> for, to start this for the two years? Yes, that's the beginning of it. So as they're going through, they can go ahead and start because it is the two years, but they don't have to wait till the end of the two years to start sharing what they're learning with their staff. So as they're going through, and that's one of the reasons why I'm involved in this piece, so that I can help guide the principals when we're having our meetings and stuff and, and be like, okay, these are things that we're learning about right now. How are we making movement and implementing as we go through the training at our sites? So we're not waiting until the very end. So <clears throat> if this is approved, I take it you'll start it, or will you, will you be starting over the summer or at the beginning of the school year? Once it, if we get the approval, people can start to go ahead and do it right away. And then, so effectively, when would you see administrators at the very earliest would be able to start training their- July? Their, their um, oh, their teachers. teachers. Um, the way the timeline that I was looking at it in terms of principal meetings, I wanted to give everybody, like I would want to start in July. I'm just speaking for me. I would encourage the other ones to do that as well. Um, 
But if we're looking at it kind of like on a October basis, you know, that gives them, if they didn't start in July, then they would start in August. That would be my expectation for the administrators. So that we'd have August, September, October, we're looking at our first round of what have we gleaned in the first couple months that we can start to put into place and make some shifts. Got and then it. we just do that kind of like on an every two months. What are we pulling in now? What are we shifting at the sites? Okay. That aligns with the eight face-to-face -face professional learning sessions too. So we do the asynchronous work. We meet with one of their trainers for a full day and then we're able to take it back to our sites. Yeah. Got it. That, and that makes total sense to me to be training administrators first. Um, so, and I'm fully supportive of it. What I'd like to see is it sounds like probably we get around maybe this time next year, maybe you could at least come back with a report and discussion item, um, even if it's like in June, and just as a report and discussion, just update how's it going, how did it work, what you found, and I think that would be most helpful okay. for the board. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, any other further? Do we need a motion or anything? We do need a motion. I have not had a motion. motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve. Trustee DeServa has made a motion to approve. Can I have second. a second? I have a first. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you so much. Thank you both for answering so many questions. Um, now we will move to item 12.8, the data science course approval, and this report will be presented by whom? Um, I'm going to be presenting on half of Lisa Aguirre. Good evening, President Acosta, board members, and Dr. Contreras. Data science is the math of the present because it's now here. Our future is now here. And the data science process, which is listed up there, are the kind of analytic thinking that we need our students to know. So why data science? Why now? We're inundated with data and information every day, all of us. And making sense of this information allows us to make good decisions. Data science gives us the ability to look at information in multiple ways through visualizations and data mining. Artificial intelligence is pervasive in our lives, and data science gives us the tools to understand the algorithms that drive it. And data science allows us to integrate the disciplines of analytic mathematics, statistics, and computer science. So consider this graph based on real data. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What story does this graph tell? Well, clearly, if we all stop eating ice cream, then we can prevent shark attacks. Or is there a confounding variable not shown? Temperature. When it gets warmer, we eat more ice cream. When it gets warmer, we go swimming, and we have more shark attacks. What data science does, and looking at this simple example as one, it gives us those tools to analyze the data to get the true correlation between related data points. How often do we see that in media where we see two things that are correlated that are completely unrelated? And it's true data. Sometimes you can't believe the truth when it's represented inappropriately. And data science gives us those tools. So the course that we're going to be using has been developed at Stanford through the U-Cubed initiative. And just tonight, I finished a course of over 40 hours that is the training that all our teachers will get. And I went on ahead and I learned that so I could understand this course. And I was literally super impressed, blown away. It's been vetted over several years at hundreds of high schools in California. And it's project-based learning that engages students as data scientists. They're not learning about data science. They're performing it. And the most exciting part as I went through this was how relevant the curriculum was to current issues. Like looking at music playlists and AI, like how does Spotify know to recommend that song for you? Or skin tone representations in media, advertisement, and entertainment talk about looking at equity issues through the lens of true data that they're gathering themselves. They go out and they'll pick magazine articles and things, and then using a data tool we give them, sample skin tones. And with these tools, be able to represent these graphics in multiple ways. 
It addresses environmental issues through students collecting data on their water usage or electricity usage and then analyzing that based upon what they can do to improve that. And finally, it looks at the use of machine learning to predict individual or group preferences. I mean, we see that when you know, Amazon is recommending we do this or that email we get. How does machine learning do that? And finally, it uses data visualizations to promote understanding of information through multiple representations. So my ask today is that you approve this much needed course, a course that will give many of our students the opportunity to uh, engage in and appreciate advanced mathematics. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, no we don't. Yeah. All right, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. I'll Trustee Dr. Holmes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if you can expand on how the data science class is different than a statistics class. I, I saw, you know, from the present that it can lead into statistics or AP stats, but is, is it basically designed as kind of a precursor? It's actually a fundamentally different course. Uh, statistics is the machinery with which we analyze data, where we look at distributions and means and those. What data science does is it starts by looking at is the data set itself what we need. It looks at visualizations. It takes outside information that we're with and tries to make sense of it, where statistics is sort of the mathematical machinery where we learn how to process that. So the statistical analysis is a very real part of the data science, but the data science then gives us the, we do the statistical analysis, and now we know how to pick the breast representation of that data to bring um, our topics across. So it's Combining the skills of data visualization, which is part of computer science, the analytic math skills that you need to test those data sets. Uh, it inco involves linear algebra, so when we do a preference matrix or songs, I don't want to get too mathy here, but the linear algebra that it involves comes from pure mathematics. And we're not going to see that in a stats class. So we're seeing the combination of linear algebra, you know, algebra two type topics with stats, with computer science, um, so it's truly integrated education that informs the kind of work that students really will be asked to do. I mean, how many of us all look at data all the time, and yet we still need to learn more on how to do that? So that's kind of the difference, if that answers your question. No, it, it does. Thank you very much, and I, I, I appreciate it. It's like the, the number geek part of me was like, okay. ooh, this is interesting. So I, I'm, I'm very much in support, and I'd like to move to approve. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. And Trustee DiSerpa? I'll second, and I'm so sorry if I missed this, but this is A through G approved? It is in the um, uh, A to G uh, approval uh, process, process. It, but it has been, the course that we um, modeled it after has been approved, so Great. yes. Great, okay, and is it available at all three comprehensives? So. Um, Will it be? It can be offered there. I don't know that it will be offered at all three schools next year. That was not a decision that I made. I can tell you that the intention is that it's also going to be offered at our alternative ed schools. So um, Pajaro Valley High School has plans, I think, to um, have it uh, Renaissance High as well as a uh, new school for this year. And I guess based upon that success, if the other schools um, wanted to offer it, that would be a decision that they would come through the school and the student needs. Okay. Was there a motion yet? I, I, yeah, and I thought you seconded it when you first spoke. I did second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's very late. <laughs> Thank you. That's how I recorded it. Thank you, Trustee DeServa, Trustee Bolano Scow. Sure, sure. Uh, my question is there, a, I was looking at the pathways. Is there a requirement? Does the student have to have a certain level of math to take this class or not necessarily? Or what, what, is a, what is their expectation there? It's a good question that you ask. Currently, the requirement to be in that class is a successful completion of Math 2. Depending upon a uh, ruling next year that may come from the UC uh, Board of Regents, that requirement may be Math 3. 
We're optimistic that this incorporates enough of those topics that this can be a third year math alternative for someone who is looking to go down more of the statistics analysis computer science pathway versus the straight analysis calculus, you know, differential equations engineering pathway. So it, it allows our students to have multiple uh, ways to access it. So it can be accessed as a third year course, possibly a fourth year course. As a third year course, it leads well into both AP stats and or AP computer science, which is not on my matrix because that's not a math class. So is math two, is that algebra or algebra two? So in our district, we use integrated mathematics. And so the courses of algebra one, geometry and algebra two, They've taken all of those standards and they've made them into Math 1, Math 2, and Math 3. So Math 2 incorporates many of the algebra standards and geometry standards, but they're all blended throughout. Um, if you look in our county, every school district in our county uses the integrated um, math design. And do you know how our students are doing, how our math scores are, are we how, how in our high schools? I do know that, and um, we have many of the same, uh, we've, there's m multiple ways that we look at that metric, through the NWA scores, we're looking at that metric through how our students are doing through pass rates of Algebra 1, or excuse me, Math 1, and also the um, 11th grade um, CASP or SBAC scores, and we have a lot of room to grow in those areas. We have dismal numbers of kids who are proficient in 11th grade, and I'm, I don't have, know the exact percentage, but it's less than 50%. I'd have so, to so, look so I guess, up on our dashboard. So, yes, so I guess my question yeah. there is, is how does, what's the vision knowing that? Is this, is this like something just alternative to given that reality, or is it is a way, an alternative path for kids who are struggling, or how are you seeing, what's your rationale there with that, with, given that reality that we're dealing with? I think it's a combination of all the above. Um, research recently coming out of Stanford, the Joe Bowler showed that students who take data science go on to take more mathematics. So part of it, to be transparent, is we're wanting to give students a math class that's relevant, that's meaningful in their life, that they'll engage in and get enthusiastic about, and rewrite that narrative about themselves that I am a mathematician and I can do math. So I think it's, there's a lot of layers to that. So I can have an advanced student who says, you know, I really want to do an applied math class. I can be in that class. I could also be a student for which the sort of um, pure analytic trigonometry mathematics is just not my thing. I'm not engaged. And I haven't been successful in math, but now I try this class and I can be, because the assessments are going to look different. It's project based. I'm, you know, it's real outcomes for real ideas. Thank you. I'm done. Good. Good. Yes. Thank you, Trustee Blasco. Trustee Deserpa. So, um, when we were interviewing. Um, superintendent candidates, one of the things that I particularly liked about Heather Contreras, Dr. Contreras, is that she's coming from a district that has math scores that are much better than Pajaro Valley. And so hopefully, I mean, that I know that that's something that you want to work on. Um, so I think hopefully we have um, some improvement in these areas. I'll say that I was not a math lover going through school until I had the right teacher who made it really fun, and I finally got it. And so this particular class looks really fun. And so for kids that are struggling, I think this would be a good entryway into learning to love math. Thanks. All right. All right, I have a first and a second. Um, so I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstaining? That will carry six zero one. We we had already called on public speakers and didn't have any cards submitted, Marilyn. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Item 12.9, approved resolution number 23-24-47 and service agreement ordering election requesting oh, Monterey can't. County oh, elections to conduct the election, requesting consolidation of the election and specifications of the election order. And this report will be presented by um, Superintendent of Pajaro Valley Unified School District, Dr. Heather Contreras. 
Yes, and this is an action item. This is a resolution ordering the elections, requesting the Monterey County elections to conduct the election, requesting consolidation of the election and specification of the election order for trustee area three in the Monterey County to be held on November 5th, 2024. And you have the attachments um, there, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. We have none. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion, or deliberation. Seeing none, can I have a, oh, please, Dr. Holm? Trustee when, Dr. when do we have to deal with like the Santa Cruz County elections or do we, has? That is a good question. They haven't sent us anything, so, but we have until July. Do you hear that? For the record, we have until July. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll move to approve. <clears throat> I have a first. Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 1210, an addition of a June 22nd, 2024 meeting to the board schedule for board development, and this report will be again presented by Superintendent of Pajaro Valley Unified School District, Dr. Heather Contreras. Yes, this action item is um, something we have talked about in the past, and it really is or in order to align the mission and the vision of the district with effective governance principles and provide a clear framework for decision making and accountability. We're asking that leaders forward consultants will work with the superintendent and the board to facilitate the development of unity of purpose and governance team values and the development of a comprehensive governance handbook and the board self-evaluation tool as well. Uh, this action item will add June 22nd, 2024 to the school board meeting schedule to be able to do this work with the board. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion, and deliberation. Questions? Comments? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. I have a motion to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. Any other deliberation? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, that carries 6-0-1. Add June 22nd to your all's calendars, please. What time? I think we were looking at 9 in the morning till 1 in the afternoon. Thank you. That will be dependent, though, on facilities. Yes. And we might be able to have, um, I'm sure Dr. Contreras will just be able to put that in a communication to the board. Yeah. And it will be announced um, at our next at board our next meeting board. to confer for the public. Or if the following, no, the next no, one. Next one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Moving on to 1211, holding the remaining of 2024 board meetings at the city chamber, city council chambers. This report will be presented by Superintendent of Pajaro Valley Unified School District, Dr. Heather Contreras. And so I'm asking for the board to take action on uh, the request to hold the remainder of the 2024 board meetings at the city of Watsonville council chambers, except for October 23rd and also um, asking to remove the special August 14th board meeting. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion, and deliberation. Uh, Trustee bolano -Scow? Why October 23rd, or just can you explain that date? There, there's not the availability, um, and I think we're looking at um, doing that one at the Mellow Center. But again, we have to check availability, and we'll bring it back to the board so the board can be informed, and the public, of course. But it's just the venue's not available that one day. And then we also don't need the special August 14th board meeting to evaluate the superintendent since we will not be evaluating the superintendent. Right, right. Okay. Well, that sounds good to me. I think it's yeah. nice to have meetings here because we get a... Good crowd and a lot of interest, so it seems like a nice place, but uh, sounds good to me. I'll, I'll make a motion. Sounds like I have a motion. Thank you, Trustee bolano Scow. I'd like to second that. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Anyone else? Is, there a, is there a fee associated with being in, in this chamber? 
they do not charge a rental fee. That's great. And the reason we're here is just because we're expecting large crowds of people, or why are we here? I'm confused. <laughs> it's just suffice to be a better venue, and our community partners with the city of Watsonville are happy to work with us and to help accommodate PVUSD. Oh, so we're never going to be back in the district office again for our board meetings? No, we're not saying that. Okay. This is just to the end of this uh, calendar year at this time. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought I heard mumbling. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, so we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye. No, I mean, I'm opposed to that. Okay, and anybody abstaining? So that will carry five, one, one. Okay, <clears throat> now we will move to our report and discussion items. Um, we will start with item 13.1, the California State Seal of Biliteracy. This report will be presented by the Director of Equity, State, and Federal Programs and Accountability, Mr. Michael Berman. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, President Acosta, members of the board, and Dr. Contreras. Um, tonight, I once again have the privilege of presenting you with this year's update on this California State Seal of Biliteracy. Um, as you will remember, the seal is, rec is recognition um, bestowed on the seniors that have attained a high level of prof proficiency in both English and another language. Um, the requirements have been basically twofold. One is to demonstrate proficiency in English um, via the completion of coursework and the 11th grade um, CASP test. If, there's, if they're English learners, they also have to demonstrate proficiency in English via the LPAC. For their language other than English, there are multiple ways, including AP tests, um, uh, coursework. And the, the, the main ones that we have are AP tests, coursework. Coursework, they'd have to take four years of study or comparable to an AP class and get a 3.0 in those courses. There has been a major change that we got to capitalize on this year where the English proficiency became an OR. Rather than having to do both, the coursework and the testing, it became an OR. And in order to have comparable rigor, they, added, they made it from a 2.0 average to a 3.0 grade point average in the English classes. So with that, we were able to qualify more students um, because they, we ha we've had a lot of students in the past that have had one or the other, but didn't have both, and therefore we weren't able to, um, to award them. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to three of our um, elementary slash K-8s who are bestowing the elementary and middle school ribbons to students. Um, H.A. Hyde and um, Starlight have about 30 each. Uh, not, it's not solidified yet because they still have some of the criteria they're going through. And then Alianza has, I think it is 12 eighth graders and um, about 24 fifth graders. Um, and then here's our numbers. Here's the drum roll. It's actually up to 142 um, students uh, and 30 pending. So we've had two of those pendings on the bottom become approved um, over the last week since we did this report. Um, so we're happy that uh, as time goes, we, we have more students that are passing Cabrillo courses. They're passing tests. Um, counselors know that at, even at the, at, you know, when we get into summer and we get some of those last tests coming in, either APs that they're taking this year or, um, or Cabrillo courses, that we're turning them into awards and we'll be able to retroactively award them um, anytime. Um, some of you were there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the certificate that they get. So they got a medal at the, at the awards assembly. Um, and if they weren't able to attend, they got it at their awards nights. They got a certificate on their awards nights and on their um, diploma, they'll have the, the golden star. A um, Couple highlights from both this evening and the, the, this year's awards. Uh, we have languages that we've never had before, um, including and especially want to call out Misteco. Um, we have two students that received the seal by literacy in Misteco um, for the first time. And we're really excited about that. 
Uh, and then in general, it was a lovely evening, lots of families, and, and I've, it's been lovely because I've been going to some of the schools since, and some of the kids are coming up to me and like, hey, you're the Sila by Literacy guy. Um, and so it's lovely connecting with them afterwards. And with that, um, do you have any questions? Oh, sorry, you're looking at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not we, in the picture. We don't have any pu public comment on this <coughs> either. So I'm sorry, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, Trustee Deserpa. I was just wondering, you said if I have any questions and I'm, we're, I'm not in the picture here. Oh, okay, wait, there we go. <laughs> oh wait, there you are, way in the back on the left when you got oh, it. Thank <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, this is a wonderful, wonderful achievement. Um, I see two numbers on that, on the, list that you had and there were asterisks but there's no definition of no key about why um they were kind of covid numbers in that the requirements changed a lot okay. in how they were um, assessed and, and granted okay great yeah. well congratulations on 142 so far yeah thank you thank you trustee de serpa anyone else trustee bolano scow uh, thank you. Uh, how how how, off, how long have we been offering the Misteco pilot? We tried last year, and we weren't able to secure a verified assessor, and so we made a district one this year. So this is the first year. Okay, cool. Because okay, I think at our last meeting we passed something to get a stipend for some staff who can help us with that. So it seems like it's all kind of jiving together now. So we can that's that's great. All right. Well, thanks for this. Thanks for everybody who went. I heard great things. Sorry I couldn't be there. Pride of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. Anyone else? Trustee Flores. I just wanted to say congratulations to those uh, students who have achieved this really remarkable um, thing. And I was really sad I couldn't be there either. I had, I, I think I had a family emergency that night, but I remember, you know, this, this is a fun evening to really admire, you know, what they've accomplished. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Anyone else? Thank you, and thank you for your work. And looking at 2012 to 2024, 12 years later, those numbers, that's just amazing. Congratulations to you, too, and for the work you're doing and helping to build that. Thank you for all that support you do for our students. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. And I will say congratulations again to all those students. You said it already once that night, but thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Wonderful. Moving now to item 13.2, the Youth Truth Survey data. Um, this report will be pre presented, excuse me, by the superintendent of PBUSD, Dr. Heather Contreras. So good evening. Um, this is a report on the Youth Truth Survey results, which, which is a survey that we conduct with our students, our parents, and our families. Uh, we've been conducting that for several years, and mainly it's to get information around climate and culture. What you're also gonna to notice tonight is a new format um, of a board presentation and going forward, we'll be streamlining all of our board presentations to be in a similar format, uh, just to help with uh, the board not having to go through different formatting and uh, that we will always have a sense of purpose with that. Go to the, yeah, thank you. So one of the things in the new format is we'll always have this slide, and this is to remind us of what our collective why is and the PVUSD mission. So we'll see this slide as the second slide, um, and we're using it for the first time tonight, although the mission has been around for many years. So the mission of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is to educate and to support learners in reaching their highest potential. We prepare students to pursue successful futures and to make positive contributions to the community and the global society. And this uh, report tonight on the Youth Truth Survey results helps us to know how we're doing in some of those areas of our mission. So the purpose of the presentation is to provide the board and the PVUSD community results of the 2023-2024 school year Youth Truth. And I am proud and amazed to be able to state that on all the school visits, and I've been to almost all the schools now, um, almost every single principal talked about this survey and how they were using the survey results with their staff. And I think that's really impressive that uh, not only are we trying to get this information from our um, all of our shareholders, but we're actively using that and it's being used at the most important level, which is back at the site. 
This is in alignment with our district goals, and you'll be seeing this in future board presentations that will always align back the um, reports that we do to what our district goals are so that we're looking to make sure all of our actions are aligned. Um, so this aligns with our academic readiness goal, understanding how ready our students are to learn, high quality learning environments, and you'll see that in some of the report, our climate and culture focus, as well as family engagement and special services. And you'll hear that throughout this report uh, in the Youth Truth Survey. So who did we hear from? We actually heard from an astounding 15,875 PVUSD students families and staff, which is an amazing survey result. So some folks are doing a really great job of um, administering the survey and getting people to be involved. Um, breaking down that 15,875, 10,654 were students, so that's an 85 percentage rate of our student population, which was a 12% increase from last year. 4,131 were families, that's 26%. So you can see we might not have quite the captive audience of our families as we do with our students, but we can work on that. Uh, but that is 5% more than last year. And then 1,090 of our staff, which is 67% of our staff responded, and that's 8% more than the previous year. So this survey looks for themes, and it asks questions around themes. Those themes are the stars that you see in this presentation. So they're engagement, relationships, culture, academic challenge, belonging, instructional methods, college and career readiness, communication and feedback, school safety, resources, and professional development. Later in the presentation, you'll see an example of what some of those um, questions looked like or statements that students and families had to, and staff related to. Um, we have some high rating themes. Um, we say they're high rated because when we compare them to other districts in California that took this same survey, we look at the percentile of what all those different responses were and where did we align in that percentile. So each of these slides looking at like students, family, staff, are showing um, areas of strength for us in some key areas because we either matched the California percentile or we had students respond, students, families, and staff respond in a higher um, rating than, um, than the state of California. Who took this survey? I want to be clear about that. So you can see that uh, we have some relatively strong um, comments and feelings of our um, survey takers in the area of belonging and peer collaboration, that's for students. We had a high rating, a really high rating actually, in the area of engagement for families, which is a huge source of celebration and something that I have been noticing throughout all of my visits at the school sites and different community engagements. Um, staff felt that school safety was uh, ranked higher than what we would see um, in other districts in California. Students rated their instructional methods the teachers were using in a, in a high rating, as well as families with engagement, staff with engagement, and um, college and career readiness. Our students felt that they were being prepared. Families uh, felt that, again, that they were feeling engaged um, in areas of high school. We broke this down, so it's like, kind of what, what are the elementary school people saying, what are the middle school saying, and what are high school saying. And in future slides, we're gonna have a little bit more breakdown of information. We did have some areas that demonstrated to us that it's an area, of, will be a continued area of focus because these were lower rated themes. These were themes where students uh, rated themselves or families or staff rated themselves lower than what we saw across other districts. For elementary school, our students uh, felt that they didn't have as much engagement in their classrooms. Our families felt that the relationships were, for the most part, positive, but that could be an area of growth because we were a little bit under what California was. Um, and staff felt professional development and support was an area where we could uh, do a little better in. In, high, in middle school, relationships was also an area that we might want to concentrate on or find more information about why they ranked it that way. Our families uh, had still had relationships as kind of high, uh, but it was a little, you know, just right on the cusp of um, the California state average. And 
again, professional development and support was one for, uh, for our middle schools. High school follows in the same theme with relationships from students. Uh, families were very concerned about school safety and staff was also incredibly concerned about school safety. So these are the student survey results where we're going into a little more detail about some of the questions that rated really high or ones that were areas of growth. So our highest overall rated theme for our students when compared to other participating schools at the level included instructional methods and emotional and mental health support. Uh, a notable finding within that was that the high schools rated higher, but we saw a downward trend from previous years in our elementary schools and middle schools. The over, lowest overall rated theme for students was engagement. We saw that in the previous slides, uh, as well as relationships, which was also discussed in the previous slides. Um, some notable findings with this were the elementary schools were tending kind of to go downward across all the themes, but most notably in the relationships and academic challenge. And the middle school and high school's lowest rated theme remains the same as the previous school year. So students highest and lowest rated questions, so this is a sample of what were the kinds of questions we asked our students. Um, the highest rated was, does what you learn in class help you in life? So elementary schools felt that uh, it did. Uh, students from my school treat adults with respect. That was highly rated for middle schools, which is, is quite notable for middle schools. Um, and what I learn in class helps me outside of school. That was from high school. Our lowest rated themes was, do you think your teacher cares about you? That's in elementary school. And how many of your teachers believe that you can get a good grade if you try? That was middle school question. And how many of your teachers believe that you can get a good grade if you try? Also came up as a theme for high school. And these questions were the same and had same responses, similar responses as the previous school year. And these are family survey results. So looking at the family's highest and lowest rated theme, we had engagement as a notable finding for both elementary school, middle school, and high school. Uh, communication and feedback continues to trend upwards at elementary school, so our families were feeling like they had good levels of communication and feedback between the school and themselves. Um, and then relationships increased at middle school um, by 10%, which is a significant in percentage increase. The lowest overall rated theme for our families was relationships at the elementary school and middle school and then school safety at the high school. And these are the same areas that were notable in the 21, 22, and 22, 23 school years. So the questions that rated the highest and the lowest were, uh, I feel empowered to play a meaningful role in decision making at my school. That was high for elementary school and middle school, which is phenomenal. And I feel represented by family, parent and family groups at my school, at, which is in the high school. The lowest were teachers and students care about each other, my school runs smoothly, and my children's learning environment is safe. And you can see the ES is elementary and the MS is middle school and then high school. And our staff survey results, following the same notable findings, um, our staff rated engagement and school safety as a notable finding. So although they rated uh, school safety as a lower, there was still an increase of 28% in the feelings towards school safety and an increase in 15% in the culture. The lowest theme that was notable was professional development and support in the elementary schools and middle schools and then school safety in the high school. Um, and although the professional development did was a notable area, it is noteworthy to say that there was an improvement from the previous year in the elementary schools. So our staff lowest and highest rated questions, um, I feel comfortable speaking honestly to families about their child's progress. Families treat staff with respect, and I feel comfortable speaking honestly to families about their child's progress that was in the high school. Lowest rated, I have access to meaningful professional development, so there's that professional development coming back up. 
Uh, teachers in my school work together to improve instructional practices. That was in middle school. And I feel safe from harm while at school, high schools. And both high school questions, those responses being a lowest theme um, and highest theme, remain the same from the previous year. So we want to pay attention to the areas of improvement and celebrating the strengths. So our strengths tell us where are we doing really well and how can we maybe replicate that across other areas. And the areas of improvement would suggest to us that we need to maybe do a little, get a little further information. What does that mean and how can we do better? So here's some areas for improvement. Uh, the belonging as a theme is trending downwards for our students, which is uh, interesting because they did rate the relationships as a little better. Um, a trend to pay attention to at the middle school level is that our non-binary, transgender, and LGBTQ plus students are rating lower than their peers across all themes, but except in the theme of relationships. And then the gaps for uh, these students, though, are not as noticeable at the high school level, and the trend of rating higher in relationships for these students continues. Some areas of strength include that our special education and English learner students at the middle school and high school are reporting more positive perceptions than their peers across all themes, and that's great. Uh, fifth and sixth graders also report having a high being high across all themes in their middle school survey, especially in the area of belonging and peer collaboration, which that is not typical for our middle schools. And our middle schools rating all their relationships in the previous slides um, is also not typical. So there's some good work that must be happening in our middle schools. Uh, areas of strengths also include that the middle school, well, the percentage of secondary students who are reporting stress, depression, and anxiety as their num number one obstacle to learning has dropped, so that is great. The middle school decreased by 4% and high school decreased by 6%. Um, the emotional and mental health theme is high for elementary and second, for elementary schools, 52nd percentile. Middle schools is in the 64th and high schools is in the 84th. In college and career readiness, students are asked, this year have you participated in any of the following services from your school? And you can see that students reported accessing all of the resources except for SAT and ACT prep at a higher rate uh, than, than the previous year. So our next steps, like I mentioned earlier, are to look at this summary of district findings and share them with families so that families can see the themes and that we're being transparent with our families. Um, school sites and departments, like I said earlier, I'm so impressed. They're reviewing the data. The data. They are creating summary sheets to share with their community. Um, but I also have also heard goal setting and looks to the future for how they're going to improve conditions at their school site. Um, and then we'll, like I said, we'll evaluate the systems that are in place that can support identified improvement areas for our students, families, and staff. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. <clears throat> Do we have any public comments? No, we don't. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for comments, questions, and deliberation. Uh, Trustee Flores. Um, the information that we find out in this survey is so important to really figure, find you know, where, where our students are, our staff, our parents are. And those numbers of who took the survey, that was, that's remarkable. I loved that. And um, obviously our sites were doing you know, a good job at pushing. I, rem I did ask my three students, did you take the Truth Truth Survey or not? Because I was going to help them if they had it, and all of them had. So, and then I know at Aptos, at Pickup, I saw Dr. AHS running from car to car with the paper. Hey, have you taken this, you know, to all the parents? So I thought that was really cool to see her out there really, you know, trying to get engaged with the parents. And at, uh, WC, at WCSA in Alianza, they had a little friendly competition going. Okay. And it was definitely like down to the right, hey, we're, you know, we got them by this, we got, you know, and it was, so yeah, I thought, I think, obviously I think all the sites were really trying to get this information that now we have and we need to, you know, put to work and especially in those areas of improvement 
we, yeah. we know what we've got to do now and let's do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Others? Trustee Bellano Scout. Yeah, I think this was a very good presentation. Uh, woke me up, uh, <laughs> even though it's 11.53 at night. Um, and, I, and I can appreciate that it's n appropriate not to put all the school's data in because I think we all have a sense that some schools are, we're just knowing our, our schools, there's gonna be quite a bit of variance. Uh, the thing about safety at our high schools does stick out, and that's been a big theme and problem at Pajaro Valley High School, and I know something we can we can definitely improve on there. Um, I want to say about the culture and professional staff morale and issues we've heard with the union in the past and just my own relationships with teachers talking about having time and space to figure things out in a proactive way, you know, something in life we, we make a plan, but we just got to deal with our students as they are, and you can make a plan, and it's not always one size fits all. Um, and so having that kind of culture where our teachers can feel included in, in problem solving as well, um, and having having the time and space to do that at times. And I think I've heard some better things about the PD, um, and just just having just being a music teacher, I know that's, that's true in my case as well, just having some time and space to figure things out. Uh, if everybody's if everybody's minute is planned to the to the nth minute, it's just we're going to stress and burn people out, and people are going to leave. And maybe that was the way PVSD ran on purpose in the past. I don't know, but it's some, sometimes that, you know we'd hear, hear that from teachers. It's just well, we're just going to have training grounds for new teachers, just burn them out, and they're going to leave, and we don't pay that well. And so I'm hoping we can. I think we've already been improving that. And I think we can. We can do that by creating a better culture, and and the and the thing about a culture it is really is uh, an administrative uh, thing from the DO to our principals. We can look at all of our schools where we have a great principal, an okay principal, a not so great principal, and boy, does that make every difference in how everybody treats each other, how the students feel about it, how the parents feel about it, and so I know that's something, Dr. Contreras, you got a lot of experience in, something you can help bring and improve to this district. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing your initiatives and, and, and whatever's been working great in Modesto. If we can find a way to, to apply that here, let's, let's do that and do, make it a way that works for PVSD. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Belanosco. Anyone else? See none, okay. Uh, thank you both for your comments, Trustee Flores and Trustee Blonsko, and I just wanted to piggyback on, on what Trustee Flores was saying. I think that's really great hearing how um, much the principals were really working to get the messaging out to take the survey, right, as a researcher, as well as you, right, we know the importance of that sample size, too, in a survey as well as the questions that are asked, the structure and the ordering of how those questions are asked. And um, what was the time frame that the survey was open? If you, by chance, do you know by chance? Okay. Oh, for the whole month of February it was open? Yes. So it's 29 days, because we had leap year. Okay, all right, no, just appreciate the one to know that. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then, nobody else? Okay, and then I'm gonna move us on to item 13.3, CTE program for spring update. This report will be presented by our, um, the PVUSD Career Technical Education um, Coordinator, Ms. Edwards, welcome. Good evening. Um, good evening, Board President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, and Board Trustees. My name is Julie Edwards. I'm the CTE Coordinator in PVUSD, and I have a, um, a brief report and update to share with you tonight. Okay, so the, this is the update part from the sort of look back to this year. Um, this gives us an idea of how many students have been enrolled in our program this year. 3,800 um, students, we have 48 teachers in the program, a lot of courses, um, 78, 26 pathways, 70% of our students are in a CTE pathway this year. As a one-year graduation requirement, we're gonna see that number inch up a little bit and then probably stabilize 
over time. We have a wide variety of industries that our pathways represent. We're at six high schools, and this year, 15 of our courses are um, UCCSU honors, and they are concurrently articulated with Cabrillo, so students in those courses earn Cabrillo credit, as well as getting um, a, a grade bump in their GPA for um, a C or better in a CTE course. All of our courses are A through G and have been now for a couple of years. We have four courses with Cabrillo that are dual enrolled um, courses that go at the college speed, taught by a college instructor. And um, this year we've had 423. Well, this is actually the class of 2023. Um, there were 428 students who had completed a pathway, which means they took an intermediate and an advanced course in the same pathway, which was a 12% increase from the prior year. And I would um, fingers crossed, we'll see what the class of 2024 looks like, but I would expect that number to start inching up even more. So I just wanted to share that brief update. And then um, when I spoke with you on Valentine's Day, I brought this graph. And I, I brought it back tonight because since then, the pink and the blue on the far right is new information. So the grant that we had applied for um, the, the regional K-16 grant, we've been awarded $314,000 for that particular grant in cycle one. There will be a cycle two, and there's a, I would say, a pretty good chance we're going to get another infusion of funding for that. And then, um, and that grant is funding, I'll be talking about it in a minute, health-related pathways. So patient care, public and community health and biotechnology in our district. We are patiently awaiting Golden State Pathways, very big one-time um, chunk of money from the state of California, and a week from Friday, they're supposed to announce the awards for those grants. We applied for nine of them, each at about a half a million dollars. It's um, it's going to be amazing when we see what how how that works out. I'm not I'm holding my breath because it's new and nobody knows. And they got apparently more than 600 applications, lots more than they thought. So we'll see how that works out. But I'm really really um, excited about that. And then you can see at the bottom. I mentioned this when I was here two weeks ago that the California Serves Grant Program which supports the California Seal of Civic Engagement. We were awarded um, $500,000 for that, and that's a three-year grant as well. And just a quick little update, our uh, Seal of Civic Engagement numbers um, from two weeks ago to today went from 46 to 72. So um, I was super excited about that. More students um, in the class of 2024 20, earning the seal. Moving on, um, a highlight from each school. At PV High, we're going to be rolling out public and community health as the new pathway starting in the fall. And I'll talk about a little bit of the details related to that. Um, it's a pathway that includes all of the elements of high quality CTE, particularly high demand, high skill, leading to a family sustaining wages at a variety of different professions and occupations. Student interest was very high, student advocacy for this pathway, very high, and about 100 students signed up in year one. So we'll have the first course, and there'll be essentially probably three sections of that course. We're looking for a teacher right now. The position is on EdJoin, and I'm um, doing some outreach around trying to find a really good teacher and working with HR on that. And Cabrillo College dual enrollment is already in place for this pathway. We have medical terminology and personal health as a dual enrollment pairing. So this, this pathway is going to launch with that in place. Um, lots of choices post-secondary, four-year, two-year, two-year transfer, technical training, the workforce and local higher ed programs at Cabrillo, Hartnell. CSUMB has an amazing program in health human services and public policy. It's a degree program that's super exciting. So we're talking to them. And they've actually offered to help us write our course 
Um, so that's that's a really great um, out of the gate partnership, and that's a result of the work we've we've been doing in the K sixteen collaborative. So those connections with um, higher ed are paying dividends behind besides the the funding that's gone along with that. Um, we have connections to local healthcare industry providers. Kaiser has reached out um, around student internships, and the Watsonville Community Hospital has had our students visit multiple times from the Watsonville Patient Care Pathway. This year, that will be extended to this pathway as well. And we did apply one of our Golden State Pathways applications was for this pathway. So if we get it, this pathway is going to have a really beautiful, robust amount of funding to help make it amazing. Um, front with as it launches. So, um, so that's an exciting development at PV High. At Watsonville High School, we're going to be expanding the engineering technology land, sea, air, and space um, pathway. And that we started, this was the first year at Aptos High. We had a grant for that pathway. It went so well. The partnerships are strong. And we have an interested teacher at Watsonville High that wants to teach this class. He's a physics teacher, perfect fit. And so um, he'll be working with the, his colleagues at Aptos High to learn all the ins and outs of this um, exciting pathway. Again, it's engineering, it's hands-on, it's project-based. Student interest is high at Watsonville High School. Um, we're going to start out with two sections this fall of interested students. Dual enrollment will be available. We'll be um, also offering articulation with Cabrillo in the 24-25 school year. So this first course will become a UCCSU honors course at the same time. And again, all of our local higher ed has engineering options, lots of them, comes in lots of flavors. And local partnerships, Joby Aviation, Monterey Bay, um, DART, uh, UCSC, Citrus Program, we have all these great partnerships already that we are going to be able to just scale for the students at Watsonville High. And um, again, we one of our Golden State Pathways grants was also to invest in remodeling the metal shop at Watsonville High School for this pathway. One of the, the really cool things about the Golden State Pathways grant is that it can be used to remodel a space. Very often, our grant funding is for stuff and paying teachers and training, things like that, but not to like break open a wall take down a wall, put up a new one. This grant will do that. And so we applied for that um, for Watsonville High School. And then um, at Aptos High, celebrating, and I just wrote that, big, small, tiny accomplishments, in that we are um, seeing the fruition of a two-year project, which is the tiny home project out of um, Aptos High. And it, again, fills, fulfills the elements of high-quality CTE to a, an array of jobs, and this particular um, project has had connections to local residential and commercial construction partners. In fact, um, the PV Ed Foundation has been the recipient of a $90,000 donation from Granite Construction that has fueled the beginning of building these tiny homes. It's an eight by 20 tiny home. It sits on a trailer with wheels. It's that type of a, a little dwelling. And um, it's built based on plans that our teachers follow in detail. There's a tiny home under construction at Watsonville High that will be finished in uh, about a year. So basically, the first one is com being completed this June, next one next June. Um, student suggestions informed how the um, the tiny home will be placed in the community. Basically, the tiny home is going to be transitioned to the PV Ed Foundation. They have donated the money, the granite construction donation. I'm going to show you this picture. Here comes the picture. This helps. Basically, we receive a donation. That donation goes to the Ed Foundation. The Ed Foundation donates the money for the express purpose of building the tiny home. I work closely with Jenny M and Alex uh, Alexis Persley in our finance department and Ruth Boogion and Rich Ariano to figure out how all these different parts work so that we can do it properly. 
and that we will be able to give the students this real world experience of building a whole dwelling. Um, so the funding comes to us, we buy the materials, the home gets built, the home belongs to the Ed Foundation. The Ed Found it will transition back to the Ed Foundation who will move it on into the community, receive funding for it that comes back to the district to build the next project. So that is how the, I think of it like a water wheel, picking up water and spilling it around and around and so that we can have a fully self-sustaining model and that we're not depending on any other funding source for this opportunity for our students. Um, you can see here a little bit of progress when they started, what the tiny home, um, the platform on the trailer, though in the lower left-hand corner, the framing that happened, the siding, the finished tiny home on its way. It will look very much like this, full disclosure. This is the one our teacher built when he went to be trained on learning how to build a tiny home in Fresno. So he went to a training to learn soup to nuts on how to how to do this with students and then came back and has been teaching it and um, also training the other teacher that is also building a tiny home. So tonight I wanted to share with you that um, our student suggestions on the right are that our students in both Watsonville and Aptos High went to speak with them and hear from them about what their feelings were about where they wanted to see these tiny homes end up. And they said they, they, they both schools collected their data that they wanted this tiny home to, to serve an unhoused person or someone who might not have a stable, safe living situation, to provide transitional housing for victims of natural disasters, housing for veterans who might be unhoused, a home um, for those experiencing hardship, for example, new arrivals to the US with refugee status, or housing for a PVUSD employee. And then um, the guidance that we've gotten from PVUSD leadership, Superintendent Contreras and Cabinet, is that to approach this with the Ed Foundation, we'll be sharing these guidelines with them as a service, not a profit model um, in the transition to the community. So not um, more of a final sale fixed price kind of situation. The Ed Foundation will will work together to figure out the right way to, to go about that process so that it's a fair, transparent process that centers the values of the Ed Foundation, the desires of the students, and then the legalities associated with the transition of the tiny home into the community. So, um, so all three of these, the public and community health, Lancy, Air and Space, and the tiny home um, construction are um, represent CTE at its best, where theory meets practice to serve a real world need under the guidance of trained instructors and with community support. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Seeing that, I'll bring it back to the board for comments, questions, and deliberation. Trustee Bolano Scow. Well, thank you for this presentation. There's some great things in there, certainly. Um, we have heard from PV High students about recently about the lack of a nur nursing preparation. Is that the class you propose? Is that intended to help satisfy uh, students who want to explore a nursing career? Health careers in general, but the broader um, the broader topic of public and community health is encompasses a lot more. So the students that advocated for public and community health um, were very, it's actually, it's public and community health and wellness is the, is the name of the course. So it's all about what it means to be a healthy individual, a healthy person um, in a community or healthy communities in general. But medical professions will be a part of the curriculum as well. Students are gonna earn certifications in some basic things like first aid, CPR, AED, AED and then there's one more that I'm not gonna be able to think of right now. Um, uh, teen mental health is one that they'll be earning. So they'll be getting some basic medical you know, um, training, but also kind of the whole person, not just the emergency response. But yeah, definitely. I bring, I bring that up because I know, I think at Aptos High, we used to have a pre-paramedic class 
um, health, yeah, and I know some of the Cabrillo teachers, and the teacher left and we didn't rehire that. I'm pretty sure it was at Aptos, and the Cabrillo teachers told me they felt that their students weren't as prepared uh, for their classes, also with kind of just basic reading and writing skills. I'm just bringing that up because I think it's important. Um, and then, so you mentioned something about high wage jobs and some, how do you define high wage jobs high wage jobs um well i'll harken back to february we looked at a chart then at, for an adult one adult with no children in the three county region $56,000 and change a year is a, is considered a living wage in our region um so in the CTE program, the, the metrics that were measured by, by the state and the funders that provide these opportunities for our students is that our pathways lead to jobs that provide a, a sustaining wage, right? Not necessarily at all minimum wage. It might start for a brief time in a lower paid job, but that there's a career ladder where a, a student can accelerate through that pretty rapidly, but all Every single pathway in our district leads to two-year, four-year technical training or the workforce. What, what about teaching and education? I hear we have a teacher shortage in yeah, California. Yeah, we have, we have an education pathway at Watsonville High. And the, the, that threshold that I just mentioned is basically right in that same zone as a first-year teacher. And then with the construction trades, that looks really cool. Um, and I know we used to have a construction class at PV High and trailers on the, where the field was built, and then we don't have a construction class there. And we have an amazing construction class at Watsonville High with Mr. Patino. Um, and we had a great speaker from Building Trades talking about the need to have project labor agreements with our bond measures. What are, is it right or wrong? I mean, is it? Is there a good reason why we don't have a construction class at people, why we shouldn't have one there? Should they not have one or should they have one or do you have any thoughts well, about Well, it's a facilities, you know, situation, right? Because the Aptos High and Watsonville High, older schools had traditional programs in multiple spaces, like the metal shop I referred to yeah. earlier was that. But students are able to do a transfer to a school, like if they're passionate about, they can request to attend Aptos High or Watsonville High. Um, but it would be a, in the kind of thing that would involve a large construction project. And, and indeed, many kids from PV High this year have requested transfers to Watsonville High because of the things they offer there that are not offered at PV High, which, I, as we're hearing, there's a theme there of, on a bunch of things that's unfair. And the reason why I bring this up, you know, I brought it up before, um, is because the CT stuff is really, really important. It's great. It's very important. It feels so important that we have some things that, that are so core that they're offered at all of our high schools. And I'm not sure where we've agreed on that as a board yet or policy, but having hands-on learning for so many of our kids who are in construction, there's a lot of good careers in construction. Uh, a lot of people are mechanics, plumbers. I know people who live in our areas who are doing these jobs, and those jobs are needed, and they're going to be needed. And um, I, just, I just worry sometimes, obviously PV High, I worry about PV High, but knowing the importance of these things to all of our kids, that, would, that they're equitable. Um, so I'll just, it's late, I'll leave it at that, but obviously there's a lot of great things here, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Trustee Bolanos Crow. Trustee DeSerpa? Thank you. Um, how much money do you think we've attracted in grants for our CTE programs? Since 2019, sure. when we brought the program back, back yeah. um, between eight and nine million dollars. That's great, congratulations. Between all the different sources. Some of them competitive, some of them more um, prescriptive, you know, but the lion's share are competitive. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I've, I think I've said this before, but we do have, I think, the highest number of um, journeyman trades people in the Watsonville area, the highest number of anywhere in the whole state of union um, tradespeople. It's pretty amazing. And we've got unbelievable apprenticeship programs, like five-year program down in Castroville for electricians, sheet metal workers, welding, um, and plumbing, and pipe fitters. We, I, I'm hopeful that we could make some type of 
connection with the tradespeople so that our kids can enter those programs because those are very high paying jobs. Yeah. When, our, you're, our when you're a union. Yeah. 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 Our teachers have speakers from different trades come in and for the the tiny home at um Aptos High and Watsonville High School, local um, licensed union member, um, like an electrician, a plumber, have come and helped the kids and taught them alongside the teacher. So the expert that's doing it that's part of it. That's great. So yeah, so they're getting exposure to that. should put them on a bus though, like have a field trip down there so they could see what the training centers look like. They're state of the art. They're very, very cool. Anyway, I think that would be a really good idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Server. Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you for this early morning presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm so impressed by our, our, our CTE program, what it's grown over the last four, five years now. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it continues to develop. Um, I know when, you know, we had our, our, our site visit to Renaissance, the, we were looking at some of, you know, how they're integrating, you know, some of their, uh, like production and design and, you know, and I, I thought that was really impressive. They had mentioned that they had some other ideas for other opportunities at their site. And I'm just wondering about, you know, we've heard some great things about, you know, our um, comprehensive high schools. Are there plans for expansion at some of our continuation sites? Yeah, I mean, from the beginning, we started Renaissance a couple years ago with three pathways mm -hmm. designed to be interdisciplinary together so that they could, because it's being a, a small school, to allow for more um, integration across content areas, so graphic design, plant and soil science, and then product innovation and development, with the idea that students had the idea of a farm stand or a product they could generate, bees or vegetables, and that it would be designed and marketed by the graphic design students and containers and whatever like structures could be designed by product innovation and design. And the, then COVID sort of happened in the middle of that and we've had some turnover. Um, but there, they do have, they have great ideas and we have um, plenty of ways that we can support and extend what they're doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, well, is that I just want to commend you. I, you probably get tired of hearing me say that over and over for everything you're doing in our CTE pathways. You have just taken PBUSD leaps and bounds from when I first came to this board. And th this is something very near and dear to my heart and very important. Um, it's, you know, whether students are going on to college or not be able to be open to that experience, um, and even if they are. Right, and to have those opportunities, and you've been just done a, an absolutely fabulous job <clears throat> with growing the program, and that I know that's all owed a lot of credit to you. Um, and I just, I understand, and I hear this strive to create this this sameness at each high school of the contemporary high schools, and I would just, you know, want to also caution that, you know, creating things to be the same everywhere, that's not equity. Equity is creating fairness. Sameness resides in equality, right? And equality and equity don't equal one another. They're two wholly different things. So I understand this, you know, the strides that you've taken us and also the challenges. It's not, each high school is different and in a different area with different needs. And so um, is it maybe 100% perfect to everyone? No. But, I've seen you take a leap into bounds, so I just want to commend you and thank you for that. Thanks. And all your hard work. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and that will be that. Um, to end on that high positive note, um, our next upcoming board meeting um, is our regular meeting on June 12th, 2024, and it will be held here at City Council Chambers. And for now, I will adjourn this meeting at 1221 a.m.